everybody to our mock investigation webinar that's being facilitated by HR Recruits and Vista Employer Services. My name's Jo Thompson and I'm a consultant for HR Recruit. I'm joined today by the team at Vista who will introduce themselves shortly. They're going to share their knowledge and experience and take you through their tried and tested techniques for planning and conducting an investigation. If you do have any burning questions during the session, then please put them into the chat box facility. But as there is a lot of content to go through, we do we have allowed some time at the end for a Q&A session. I'm now going to hand you over to Vista, who will introduce themselves and start the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, well, thank you for everybody who's joined this morning. Um, we've got uh, quite a lot to get through. Uh, it's gonna be quite fun packed. It's a bit different uh, and we hope you enjoy things. Uh, before we get into things, I'm going to in uh, invite my colleagues to introduce themselves. So uh, we were just saying Jen's our engine room, so I'll probably go to Jen first uh, <laughs> if you'd like to introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jen. I am the Digital Content Manager at Vista. Um, and like Stephen says, I kind of pull everyone together to make sure these kind of things happen for you guys. So um, I'm here today just to share the content and uh, be in the background if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Morning all. Morning, Ab. Well, that's perfect timing, Ab. I'm going to come to you next. You best introduce yourself. You... Okay. Uh, is, it, is my background okay? Or you is look it too like, bright? You look like you're, on, you look like you're in right. an MR5 at the moment. You might want to just shut your curtains. Ooh, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, whilst you're doing that, Ab, we'll go over to uh, Yvonne. Yvonne, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Yvonne Saxon, and I look after HR services at Vista. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a HR professional. <laughs> Some might see that as a bonus, Yvonne, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's good to hear. Um, so I'm Stephen Foster, I head up the, the legal team, if you like, the employment arm of, of Vista, uh, and Ab heads up uh, and leads our investigations. So um, I'm not sure how many he's got on the moment, but Ab has all the everyday experience, the tips, um, and will be able to give us guidance and practical guidance as we go through things. Uh, just to sum up what we're trying to demonstrate today and what we'll be sharing with you is that I think the hardest thing um, is knowing how to start the investigation. Sometimes these things seem overly straightforward uh, and we go in with a subjective viewpoint. Other times there's so much information we don't know where to start. What we're going to start with is give you what we call, we call a game changing plan, um, which is really, really useful. Uh, and the advantage of that is it sets the focus really for what you're trying to achieve at the end. By working through this plan, it's already focusing on the report that you'll be producing at the end. And that's why it's such a game changer. It just makes your conclusions uh, flow naturally. Um, we'll obviously address how you open and close these investigation meetings. Um, and Ab has recorded a few videos with uh, Yvonne to give you an example of some live interviewing techniques. And hopefully you'll see what we're putting across you today uh, being put into practice. Uh, and then what we'd like to do then is just help you understand how you can get off the fence. Very often with investigations, you'll have one word against another, and it's how you come down in favour of one person uh, and the strength and balance in the evidence that you have. So that's the structure for today. Um, Ab, we can see you now. So if you'd like, to, you. if you'd like to in introduce yourself and your beaming smile, that'd be fabulous. OK, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's well today. Uh, my name's uh, Abaymi Alamaru. Um, you'll be relieved that everyone calls me Ab or Abby for short. Um, as Stephen said, um, I'm um, uh, the head of our investigation service here at Vista and um, um, one of the um, founding fathers of Vista as well. Um, but uh, in terms of um, today's session, my every day um, for the last uh, 10 or 15 years has been doing some element of investigation work. So um, hopefully, as we uh, look through um, the scenario, I'll be able to help you get some idea of um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and uh, how to do it better as well, because we're always striving for that. So uh, welcome, everybody. Fantastic. So I know some of you may well have seen um, a grievance letter that may have gone out to some of you beforehand. But what we'll do for the benefit of everybody is that we've now got the complainant deck who has kindly recorded um, his complaints. What I'd like you to do when we start looking at this is to try and identify the issues. What we talk about is one of the most important things you can do and, and something Ab does really well. Um, and something I never used to do before I joined Vista is really, really boil down what your remit is. What is it that you're actually investigating? 
Ab, um, is that where you start, or how how do you how do you go about identifying the remit? Um, well, as um, an external and independent investigator, I think one of the things that we always observe on is that from the very outset, defining the terms of reference. So, what is it? that the investigator is looking at and how do you want the investigator to go about it? What's the measure for making findings? Is it um, beyond all reasonable doubt? Is it the balance of probabilities? Is it something else? So having the scope drawn out carefully from the beginning is really, really important. So once we see um, the uh, complaint, then we will also see that we can identify what the scope might be in this particular case fantastic all right with that in mind what we'll do then is we'll just give jen a moment just to uh click on the video but you'll see now deck talking to us um and what i'd like you to do is work out what you would think your remit is in this case what are the issues that need to be investigated so Absolutely. when you're ready then jay dear human resources i've been thinking about the best way to deal with the following situation i think it's just got to a point where i have to make a complaint can you please treat this letter as my formal grievance? I have enjoyed working for Trumpton Furniture Makers PLC for the last two years, but the behaviours of my teammates are becoming intolerable and, I've made, and it's made me think about leaving the company. My full name is Declan, but my family and friends have abbreviated this to DEC for as long as I can remember. So when I started working here, I, I just introduced myself as DEC. Since I began working here, a running joke started after every weekly team meeting with either Jude or Alex in my team. They'd say, right, all hands on deck. For the first two weeks, it made me smile. And then after that, I just started to get sick of it. But being new, I felt I had to put up with it. And I had to hope the joke would stop. It didn't. There were repeated jokes about my name. I've lost track of, of all of them. However, I specifically remember that when Bilal, our manager, told us about the renovations to his house. He explained that he was going to have a deck outside. Alex responded with, not nice for deck when it's raining at your house then. And Jude and Bilal joined in the laughing. I was already annoyed about the jokes about my name. I didn't feel I could say anything. We're a small team and I just didn't want to get any aggro. And I've been thinking it would stop, but it hasn't. What happened at the team's Christmas party on Saturday night has changed that for me now. As you know, there were about 20 of us, so there may have been some witnesses. I wasn't drinking as, I'd had to, as I had to drive home. The DJ started playing the conga, and most of the team had a few drinks by then, and they were dancing. So, we all formed the conga line. Jude was behind me. I could not believe it when Jude put her hands on my waist and whispered in my ear, it's all hands on deck now. She said it in a very suggestive, sexual way. I was shocked and disgusted, and I didn't know what to say in the moment, so I immediately left the dance floor, picked up my jacket, and went home. I felt sick and worried for the rest of the weekend. I knew I would not be able to put up with this behaviour any longer. It was the last straw, and now I feel worried about going back to work. I just want all the jokes to stop, and I want an apology from Jude. She has to know that her behaviour was unacceptable, and it has to stop. Please let me know about the next steps, and if you'd like a meeting to discuss this further. I don't know if I can last much longer, because the jokes and what happened at the Christmas party, it's making me feel ill, and I really don't want to go off sick. Yours faithfully, Dex Smith. Thanks, Jen. Excellent. Right. Well, this is quite, I would say, quite a narrow uh, area. But when you listen to how Deck is feeling, uh, naturally, if I was a, a manager and somebody come to, came to me and was expressing their views in this way, it's very hard as a, an empathetic manager or some a colleague not to actually feel for Deck here. But that's where there's a trap where you start actually judging things subjectively and you're bringing your own conscious bias into this. Uh, sometimes you may be aware of certain things that have happened in the past. You may well be aware that these comments were going on within the team uh, initially. But this is where you must go back to the remit. 
Um, and something that we often say to people is get the remit clear. What are the actual allegations? What are the issues that we are looking at? Um, and we'll see that as we come on today. Now, we talked about uh, planning. Planning, planning, planning is probably the absolute key. Um, Ab has this down to a T, but it's the planning stage that's often missed. People rush in to wanting to speak to individuals. They then go off and speak to the next person. But what you should do is what we call undertake the three part technique. So what we like to think about, as you can see on the screen is identify what actually happened. What is it that we are investigating here? So as Jen's about to click on this, we identify um, our clear remit. We keep it prompt, uh, we have clear brief prompts. So when we're having our conversations, we can focus our attention and our questions on those areas. Um, what we tend to advise is try to avoid having lists of questions. One thing that you'll see from um, Ab when he interviews both witnesses here is that he's listening very, very carefully. And one thing that I notice when we watch the videos is by listening, he can actually then connect the information that comes out through those discussions. And if you have a list of questions, it's a very, very easy trap to fall into is you just go through your list of questions. And once they are, that question's answered, whether it's a good answer or not, you then go to your next question, next question, next question. Uh, what we tend to suggest you do is think about the five W's and the H, the what's, the where's, the why's and the when's and, and how. So how did you feel? How did they react? Why didn't you raise this or what, what's the background to this? So if you remember those uh, and focus on the issues that you want to talk about, you tend to get a more um, constructive uh, balance of evidence, which makes your decisions much easier in the long run. Um, it also encourages you to probe. You will naturally, by listening, think, oh, right, well, you've mentioned that. Um, that now means I'm going to ask this and this. So very often one answer will lead you to at least another two questions. Um, but that at the end, and we keep talking about the end because you need to produce your report, it enables you to evaluate the evidence. Um, so the first thing is to do is identify that remit. Is there anything you would add from your experience, Ab, or is, does that cover things from your perspective? I think that covers things well. I mean, I think in terms of the um, specifics in um, Dex's um, case, and didn't he make you want to cry? You know, he, he re really did. But the thing about investigations, as Stephen said, you've got to just put that aside because what matters is what are the issues and ultimately what's the evidence, okay? So in this particular case, um, what we know is we have three um, kind of separate allegations to some extent. One is um, that um, people um, had this repeated and uh, made this repeated comment about deck, the all hands on deck comment. And um, the other is um, the comment uh, about, um, um, well, what if deck comes around to your house then? Um, because of the um, manager talking about the decking outside his house. And then the other is the incident at the Christmas party. So they are the three things um, that um, we um, want to um, look at to see whether there's evidence to support that those things happen. And then finally, in relation to all of that, we want to um, kind of understand what Dex says that those things amount to. Is it bullying? Is it harassment? Is it um, something else? Is it intimidating behavior? So that's the way I would immediately um, carve it out in my mind. And because that's how I carve it out in my mind, that's what would be in the um, terms terms of reference um, for, for, for the investigation and for the commissioning manager to approve. Yeah, I think, sorry, apologies. I think the other uh, uh, thing that would be is useful is just we just go on to the next section as well, because we talked about having natural unbiased con conscious uh, that kicks in. Um, one thing here is I think if we'd put a young lady on here and that we were talking about an older male colleague, we would have slightly stronger feelings. And that's wrong. That's well, I would say that that's wrong to, to say in some ways, because it doesn't matter if you've got somebody who's um, alleging these allegations, you should treat them equally. But that's a natural unbiased con uh, conscience that can kick in. Um, and you then start taking subjective views according to you, your, your views on these matters. So how do you deal with that? And, and Jen's already pulled that up. The second stage of the three part technique is to reduce the subjectivity and go to the objectivity. What are the rules that you are facing? So what I often do, uh, and that may have a different technique, but if I'm looking at uh, an investigation for, for a company, 
I identify the remit and the allegations. And then the first thing I do is I don't read the whole handbook. I ask for the company's policies and procedures and I go through the index. And all I do is I highlight and tick which policies and procedures I think I need. So in this case, it would be possibly the disciplinary, obviously the grievance policy, and if they've got a dignity at work or a harassment policy. And, and then I actually then get copies of those policies. Uh, if I don't know where to find those, then of course I'd speak to HR, but it's the rules which are relevant. That is your measure. It's not your subjective view. It's not your opinion. It's not your emotional response. You've got to say, what's the standard that we expect? Is that clear? And if you don't have those rules and procedures, not all companies do uh, even nowadays, then what's the law require? What is the definition of harassment in the law? And does that reflect our policy? So it, that is your measure. And that is why we, that's the most important part of this technique in my view, because it takes out the subjectivity. Um, Ab, anything you add to that? Do you look for anything else or is that, is, do, you look, do you do the same technique? Do you go to the company's handbook or do you have just a, uh, just use your, use your experience in, in, in your cases? No, absolutely, same thing. Obviously, um, what we're doing is looking at the complaint and looking for cues as to what type of case it is, what, and, and therefore it helps us to identify the policy and, and, and the rules. We heard that um, um, Deck was talking about jokes and feeling humiliated. We know that's the language of bullying and harassment. So like you say, that would attract our attention to the dignity at work policy to see how those concepts are defined and to see whether or not in um, broad terms, what DEC is alleging falls within the remit of um, those policy, that policy and the definitions within it. Fantastic. Um, when you collate this evidence, the third part of the technique is, well, you'll get a lot of information. You may get a situation where you've got one word against another, which as I mentioned at the outset, will come to and, and, and help you decide which way you, uh, you come down in your conclusions and how you get off that fence. Um, but one thing that you need to do is gather all the evidence. It may not be directly relevant to whether something had happened, but the surrounding circumstances, and you'll be looking for factors which are possibly background factors. Is this something that's gone on for a long time and has been accepted? Is this something that's having uh, any effects on Dex Health, which he's referred to? Um, what are the implications going forward? And for the individual, um, is this being banter? Is this being something that's been encouraged by the individual? Or are there any other mitigating factors? Has it been banter both ways, et cetera, et cetera? Now that doesn't change whether or not it actually happened. It doesn't change whether or not the rules have been breached which is why we approach those as the first, first two parts of our te technique. But they are relevant pieces of information which may go to how we go forward in terms of recommendations or even for the chairman of the disciplinary procedure may actually use those factors in order to decide what sanction, if any, should be imposed. Uh, and so it's absolutely crucial that you, you, you take that into account and you provide that information um, in a brief format so that they can be considered but it doesn't actually affect your decision on whether something should go forward uh, to a disciplinary. It merely is background information. Um, I actually think that's really important because that has a big out, big out, um, difference on the outcome and impact on the outcome, but it doesn't change whether the rules have been broken or not. And that's how sometimes I think it's quite a hard line to divide because again, in your mind, you're listening to all the information rather than did it happen, didn't, did it not happen? And you fall into the trap of judging the outcome. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that um, the, 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 the key thing is, and it's a judgment call on the part of the investigator, it's looking at material that's of evidential value. And therefore, that includes trying to understand the circumstances, the background, the backdrop, um, the um, kind of um, nature of relationships, all of those things are not necessarily directly related to whether or not the index event happened, but they do tell you something about the scale and scope of the index event. So, um, like you say, understanding whether or not, um, you know, colleagues have worked together for many years, whether or not there's a certain language or a way of um, speaking within the team, they would be important factors. 
from an evidential point of view, even though they wouldn't tell you directly whether the index event happened, whether or not um, Jude did put her hands on deck and whether or not she did whisper in his ear. But it does help to get some sense of the overall picture if we know how long Jude and Deck have worked together, whether or not that's the way in which Jude and Deck usually interact. So they're the kind of background surrounding circumstances that I would be honing in on because they're relevant from an evidential point of view. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more and that's really helpful, Ab. Um, what we'll do now then is, what we'll do is we'll put this into some sort of practical guidance for you. Um, what we tend to do, and you'll see as we go through today's um, session here, is that we tend to have a spreadsheet where we will put these items down the, um, across, the, across the top where you've got what's actually happened, what are the applicable policies and procedures, and then surrounding circumstances. Um, but before we do that, what we're also going to do is just help you focus your minds on what actually happened and, and the questions that we were asked. So you will see, I think Jen was just highlighting actually, you'll see the three-part technique and there is a QR uh, code there. If you scan that with your phones, that should take you through to Mentimeter um, and should be able to then will identify the questions. So I'll just give you all a moment or a minute or so just to click on there and set yourselves up. I'm going to try this, Steve, by the way. Okay, we're good. <laughs> do, I have to, do I have to take a picture of? Yeah. yeah. Just, Jen, I do. You should come up with a link, Abby. You just click. Oh, click the link. Yeah. Hold, hold, yeah. Oh, that's not okay. Yeah, I've got that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one fan. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, to, to help everybody, when you're through there, if anybody's struggling, what you can do is if you go into um, Mentimeter, so I think we've got uh, a little link that you can go to. So if you bear with me, I'll read out the link. Uh, or, Yvonne, are you able to drop the link for Mentimeter into the chat? Um, yeah, and, then we'll, and at the top of the screen, you can see on our screen at the moment, there is a code at the end of the uh, www.mentimeter. And if you drop that in. If you can't actually log on, don't worry, we will be going through these together, but I think it just helps you get an idea. So what we'd like you to do is that you'll see some questions which we've addressed at the top. And we've talked about the three te three part technique. So we'd like you to put these questions into uh, one of these categories. Does it fall into a question that would uh, come into the category of, of establishing what actually happened? Alternatively, is it the, to do with the applicable rules and policies and procedures? Or would you put that question into the category of something you would ask to, in order to establish the surrounding circumstances? Now, I'll be honest with you, I did this last night and you may be on one or two of these in two minds, okay? That doesn't mean it's wrong. It could be a question that applies to both or that you might ask it at the first stage or you might actually forget it and, and then decide to ask it when you're asking about surrounding circumstances. So there is no absolute right and no absolute wrong, um, but there is, uh, there is a choice to be made. So with no further ado, the first question is that we're gonna ask is what did Jude say? So which category, just hit your buttons, as to which category you believe that question would fall into. Now I'm sitting here nervously because nothing. <laughs> Should I flip back to the QR code for a minute? That might help, yes. Just in case people haven't got it up. Ab, does it work for you? Yes, yeah, I've made my selection. Probably wrong, but I've made it. I was it. just going to say, we'll flip back quickly and see if we can see the first response. Have you pressed submit, Ab? Yep, I pressed submit, and then it's got um, skip question at the bottom of the next screen. So, but I did press submit, and it took me to. Some it's got people a blue. Have put in the chat, that there's a different question. We've got a different question. They might have clicked forward. What's the question they've got? My actually, my next question. Yeah, they've changed? got this one. They've got this one. <laughs> what changed? Okay, so that's fine. What changed since the uh, the running joke? All hands on deck. So 
I think what what's actually happened, I can see for me, um, that's the category I would put that in. And I think, Ab, you do actually ask that when we come to see the video, you actually ask that question. Um, in terms of what actually happened, we've got a few people that said it's the policies and procedures. Remember, the policies and procedures are to do with what the company's rules are. So that would be, well, if we've got an harassment policy, we would be saying, um, how do you feel this amounts to uh, a sexual connotation? And that would be the question that would relate to the policy and procedures. I can actually see why so many people have actually put um, what uh, that it relates to surrounding circumstances, because um, whilst I would say what actually happened, what's actually changed, uh, and it's a question of fact for me, actually the surrounding circumstances, it may well be that this paints a picture. If this has been a running joke, which is what's indicated here, there may be more surrounding circumstances that we need to be aware of. Is it something that's been accepted? Was it a joke that actually was started by or, or, or uh, encouraged by DEC? So I actually think um, 15 people, I was expecting that to be slightly more balanced, um, but that's a typical question where, yes, it could fall into either camp. OK, um, I don't know whether we can go back, Jen, and just see whether people could answer answer the first question. If not, we'll carry on from there. There's, there's a few people asking for the QR card again. OK, thank you. Take a moment. Uh, what questions come up next for you on your on your screen? Um, well, I've still got the watch changed. Um, can't seem to move on to the next. That's good. That's good. We've got, we've got control. So I think Jen's back in control now. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So the first one, now we've had the idea and the practice on the one that was more difficult. What did Jude say? Where would you place that question? I'm just looking through, Stephen, because it's not changing on my... No, um, it wasn't on one either. So we'll just see what we got. There's, people are still saying they can't access the current question. It's not come up. It's not coming up. It's that um, It's that. what changed seems yeah. to be stuck. What, okay. what, why don't we just ask people to put a one, a two, or a three in the Good chat, idea. then, and then we can yeah. get an idea of what people are yeah. thinking. Yeah, That's, I think anyone one. can then give us some indication of what the uh, um, general view is on each question. Okay, maybe that's a way to do it. I think that's it. Let's let's uh, we be, we may be beaten by technology there. So if we go forward to the first question, so um, what did actually what did Jude actually say? Um, let's go with a one, two, or three in order of first part of the technique, which is what actually happened two for policies and procedures, and three for surrounding circumstances. Oh, there's been one three and everybody else is a one. Absolutely right. I think we started with a very easy one, <laughs> a very easy one there um, in that it's clear. We need to establish what happened. We need to understand what the facts are, what was said, um, and then we'll go on to what's what the responses are. Uh, what's the next question then, Jen? Sorry. <clears throat> that's all right that's all right i know you were busy trying to do the uh the it at the back so the okay. next question after that is how did jude say it so is that in the first second or third part of our three-part technique <laughs> okay, mostly yeah. ones yeah we've got a couple of threes and mostly ones again as i said on the other one uh, it is, I would put that into a one, is it's actually what happened. How did they say it? What did they say? What was your response? Those are fact-finding questions. The surrounding circumstances, I can understand that in that um, if you're accepting that it was said, then how it's said, it could be seen as a surrounding circumstance around that question. But actually, I think the majority are, are can, right there. Uh, can I add some controversy? I'd say that it also potentially falls into two more than even three because if you think about the policy issue the rules what's the nature of the behavior does it amount to bullying and harassment asking the how so it was said in a sexual manner if you think about it then touches that question of policy i.e is it sexual harassment is that how it was said in a sexual way so that's i think that answer is driving towards how 
debt positions regards Jude's behavior. He regards it as a sexual act. So therefore that's a um, kind of line into the policy, the rules, the dignity at work kind of regime. That's, that, that's probably my alternative um, to the one, because it certainly is a one um, in terms of what happened. But I think it also falls into two because it's direct. It's directed towards the nature of the behaviour as compared to what's expected. The how it was said. It was said in a sexual manner. Therefore, um, that's pointing towards the um, dignity at work policy. And Specific, the, specifically at the rules. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I see that actually. Yeah, that that's good, and that's your experience shining through there. So uh, that that's good. Okay, Jen, next question then, please. I think we've done that one, so what changed is a running joke. All right, what's the relationship like between Jude and Deck? Which category, first, second, or third of the three-part technique? Flying through there, threes, I go. Yeah, you're all very, very clear, and I don't know whether this is experience or these questions are too easy, but... I don't think I've seen any other number come up there. That definitely is a surrounding circumstance for me um, because it doesn't actually change what happened, but it may actually be a, a factor and it may actually lead to some aggravating considerations or mitigating factors. Um, but yeah, for what the relationship is, is, is absolutely right. Again, um, not preempting it, um, Ab, but again, that may go to whether this is uh, a clear breach and a constant breach of policy or whether this was a one-off breach of policy or there's no breach of policy so I could see it may fall into two but I, I agree with everything I saw which was an outstanding number of threes yeah so it's relevant evidence I mean that that's the way I would put it to get some understanding of the scope scale nature of um, the um, the alleged behavior fantastic Had Deck indicated the play on his name by the team was unwelcome. Mm. Now, does that matter is another question for me, but that's a fundamental question. So which category would you place that into? Mm. Mostly three. Mostly three. So I, saw, I did see a few. A yes, yeah, yeah, some of you was quite uh, good then. Said three and one. So I like that. <laughs> That's good. I'm going to be controversial then again, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think, so. I think you've encouraged somebody there because somebody wrote one, two and three. <laughs> <laughs> so someone's carrying a, fe a fence around yeah. with them. I like that. I, like that. I don't know whether that's a lawyer or an experienced HR uh, professional, but uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> I did like that. Okay, we'll go with the controversy then, please. Then. Ab? I, I think this is predominantly a two. Because again, when you think about the definitions that we're working with here, if we're talking about bullying and harassment, um, we would see in most policies that those concepts include almost inevitably will include some issue around whether or not the conduct is wanted or unwanted we know the definition of harassment for instance says that is conduct that is unwanted that has the purpose or effect etc so that reference to the welcoming i think is something which directly goes to the question of whether or not the definitions within the legal test and also most likely the policy tests are made out. So that's why I would be asking that question because it is helping me to understand whether or not Deck is saying that this is a um, an event that was unwelcome that therefore breaches the definition of harassment of bullying etc that that's where my mind would, would principally be 
Yeah, I, my, my mind again, um, and this is legal minds, isn't it? But my mind is that that would I would have put that into what actually happened because I think for the same arguments you've put forward is that if it's not unwanted conduct, um, then what actually happened wasn't harassment. So that's that was my thinking, but actually I can see the your thinking actually made more sense than mine. But that's why I would have gone for one um, on that. But the most important thing is that we establish that fact for exactly what you said is whatever our views are and however we feel about this and whatever our relationship may or may not be with Deck or Jude, the important thing is that we are asking this question to establish whether the rules have been broken, which is to your point, isn't it, Ab? Yeah. Um, it's absolutely fundamental, this question. And you'll note that the question isn't direct. It's not saying, well, did, was this conduct unwanted? It's a more rounded, open question, um, which is important, as you'll see when we come on to the questioning techniques. Thanks, Jen. Next question, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've just answered that one, so I might uh, skip that one before. Oh, we're all flying. Okay, <laughs> just keep it. You're all very keen. You're very good. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's outstanding. I don't think anybody's put anything but so for exactly the reasons have been explained. So uh, yeah, if we don't have that definition, there's no way we can judge that correctly. Uh, and and that would be a question that the investigator is asking himself. Incidentally, it's not one that the investigator would put to uh, any of the um, interviewees. Yeah, I think that's an important point. There would be a temptation to actually um, to read the definition out and say, look, this is this is what our policy says. You you shouldn't do that because that then becomes almost judgmental. It, it becomes quite um, uh, it more interrogatory than it is inquisitorial. Um, mm -hmm. It's for you to decide that and use questions, open questions around that topic to establish that. Uh, so what was going on for Jude at the time? Now, I think this is a sort of question that's often missed. We get so into the detail of what actually happened that we forget to say, well, what's the background? Is there anything else I should be aware of? Um, and so this is a good question here. So we've got mainly threes. Oh, did somebody put one, two, and three again? I can't believe that. <laughs> no. I'm going to try. I'm trying to, I'm going to try and catch the name next time that happens. So uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I think this is squarely in the three. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, absolutely. It, it, is, it is. So it doesn't it doesn't change what's happened. It doesn't change whether the rules have been broken. It clearly is something that may have a, a, a mitigating or aggra aggravating effect. So that clearly is squarely in three. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, and then I think we're moving towards the end, are we? This is a good question. So does the definition of harassment apply to the Christmas party outside the workplace? Remember, this is outside working hours, not on work premises. Twos and threes all the way through, I think they're all oh, one, one, yeah. Shame that we've not got an open discussion because there's a couple of people put one. So I often like to think about the, it's a bit like having these controversial answers there. They're really interesting when people are thinking like that. For me, uh, I, I, I put this in category two. I don't know whether that's strange or not. Uh, I, we tempted initially to say three because it's almost a surrounding circumstance, but it doesn't matter. If it's harassment and it's affecting the workplace, then it's clearly whether the policy has been breached or not. Um, it's, it's whether the rules have been broken for me. Um, Ab, did you have any different views on that? No, no, it's uh, more or less the same. I'd just put it a slightly different way. It's whether or not the harassment rule applies to events that don't take place during working hours and in the workplace. And, um, you know, suffice it to say, you know, that there is a lot of background law on this, but typically, again, policies will say, yes it does and policies will say that because the law does um the law's definition as to whether or not something is a work-related incident is whether or not it happens during the course of employment and that's got a very wide frame um, nowadays to include events that take place outside of work but are so closely connected with employment and um, that 
the law therefore regards them as effectively taking place in work. So that is a policy, a legal type issue, um, which as investigators want to check and if necessary research or take advice on. Yeah, and there was that case, wasn't there? I think about, it might have just been just before lockdown where an event had happened at a Christmas party. I think it was the director or owner had caused mm. personal injury to someone. And yeah. they'd actually gone on from a Christmas party, which was taking place, I think, in a hotel, to a group of them going on to a pub afterwards. And even that was held to be uh, connect, sufficiently connected to the workplace. Absolutely. So, um, that's a good example of, uh, of the point you've just made. OK, and I think we've got the final question. I'll be proven wrong in a moment, but I think this is it. So what made Jude's comments at the party seem sexual to Deck? Um, mm. We'll see how Ab deals with this, because I think he deals with it extremely smoothly. Um, far smoother than I did, but uh, I would have done. But um, this is a good question. So we've got lots of ones. What actually happened? Some people gone for a three. One and three. Yeah, good consistency there. Ab, I'm interested in your view on this one. Is that a question about what actually happened or would you say, look, this is the surrounding circumstances or do you agree with the majority here, which seem to be a one and a, a three in that it is a surrounding circumstance, but it really goes to the, the crux of what actually happened? Um, I think I'm a bit um, closer to Rebecca Profit, um, to be honest, a one and a two. Um, the um, certainly there's a look the minute that a question starts with a what then certainly you're in the category of what is happening so what what I think you could um, kind of reframe this question and say um, what was it that you did that made it feel sexual so I think that's a what happened Okay, I think that's inviting Deck to tell us about Jude's demeanor, Jude's posture, Jude's positioning. So I think that's the what actually happened element. Then the applicable rules and policies, and it's kind of directed by what made it seem sexual, is that we're asking about whether or not it fits into or how it fitted into the framework that could um, kind of define it as, as, as sexual harassment. So I, I think there's uh, elements of one and elements of two in that question for me. That's interesting. That's interesting. So I was, clear, I was clearly in one and three, which I think a lot of were, but again, it shows how the thinking is. What I would say is that what the planning does, it makes you think about these. You don't need to always get the category right as long as the question or the issue yeah. is raised and discussed. But what it does do is it helps your planning. And this planning, um, we've taken a bit of time doing this to give you some practice in actually categorizing and planning your investigation. In reality, um, it depends on what the uh, nature of the uh, allegations are, how many there are, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes in straightforward grievances, this would only take you 10, 15 minutes, but it's often the bit which is overlooked. We often rush into, straight into interviewing the aggrieved person or and then rushing off to the accused um, and it's this planning stage which is absolutely crucial if you take half an hour doing this you will save yourselves bags of time or uh, you'll even save the appeal officer bags of time if you're really thinking about long run because this is the foundation of any steps that may follow so getting this right and planning properly now is is fundamental um, Ab, on average, I know you've got this experience and you do these. Do you still take time to plan or does it vary on the type of day? I take time to plan. Obviously, the more you do it, the less time it takes. But um, I always plan. I always want to know what I'm going to say and why I'm going to say it and, you know, what I'm looking for from an interview. Can I just deal with a couple of questions um, of observations that have been made? Jeanette Dean, I think that's a very yes. fair observation Jeanette says has this anything to do with rules and policies this is about human nature and she just wants to make that point I think it has a lot to do with rules and policies because the inquiry here is directed at the nature of Jude's actions and the nature of Jude's actions are of interest to us because we want to know whether or not they could be framed, whether or not they could be put into the basket 
of sexual misconduct. And that's defined by policy. So that's why I say it's a, it, it, it's a policy issue. It's to some extent a legal issue. Does the way in which Jude made the comment in terms of her posture, her body language, um, her tone, her demeanor, call it what you will, to what extent can um, debt satisfy us that that is of a nature that is um, outside of the expected standards in the dignity at work policy? That's, the, that, that's, that's how I would frame it, which is a long way of saying that we're really asking about whether it fits into the definition of sexual harassment and, and why, what is it that she did? Well, she put, my, she put her hands not just on my hips, but she kind of slid them down a bit. That, that, that question is really about what you did, so it falls into one, and also it's directed at two. Is it of a sexual nature? So that, that, that's um, why... Um, Jeanette, I think it, it it goes into one and two for me. Thanks, Al. Um, we're going to move on to now looking at the sort of the, the one of the tabs when we go into the planning stage. Um, what I want to emphasise is we've just gone through some questions. These are not all the questions you would ask uh, in this particular scenario. Um, we focused on one area of the allegations and there would be more questions from this. The point I would emphasise, however, is that having just said we don't write all our questions out, the way I would approach this is work out the three categories that I'm looking at. Um, and then I would have both the issues. And for example, in surrounding circumstances, I would just write surrounding circumstances and then write the WWWH. So what happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? How did you react? How did you feel? When you did that, what was the response? So I don't write all those questions out, but I sort of have that WWH around that I know want to, I want to ask about the surrounding circumstances. Um, so that's how I work. Ab, do you have a different approach? You know, absolutely not. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just boil this down to, um, you know, how we naturally all have the ability to have conversations that involve obtaining information. If any one of us were gonna meet in a cafe or a pub today and want to get an understanding of, um, you know, what happened, um, in, in, in our kind of days yesterday, we would not come with a list of questions. We would very naturally sit down, put sugar in our coffee and tea and just start talking. And that talking would involve asking questions to elicit information. What did you get up to yesterday? Um, did you bump into anybody interesting? Did they say or do anything, anything interesting? So those are questions which we naturally default to when we're trying to find things out. And that's all an investigation is. So yes, of course, whilst we do subject it to a level of um, planning and, and, and trying to you know, get our um, kind of minds in order, I always say don't overcomplicate it by thinking that you need to have some kind of compendium of questions or points. Be your natural self, uh, because if you're your natural self as well, it really helps um, for the interviewee, the person you're interviewing, because you almost want to make it feel like you're not sitting there asking questions in, in a way, because if people are triggered in that way, then you tend to get a defensive and you tend to get barriers being put up. So um, what I always try to do is yes, of course, have an idea of what I want to get out of um, the meeting from an information point of view, but then I just try to apply a kind of natural inquisition um, to it. And that is what then defines each individual question, which I have not written down in advance. All I've written down is a framework of what do I want to get out of this meeting and maybe some subject headings. So what about the Christmas party I might have on my sheet? What about um, the um, manager's um, comment about the decking? I might just have that as a prompt for, um, you know, a natural conversation, trying to elicit information about those things. Yeah, I, I, um, 
when I talk to Ab sometimes, I'll be honest, I'm not sure whether he's uh, using his technique, but he talks about this nice, friendly, in the pub, in the cafe conversation. When you have a chat with Ab, he's, it's it's always that way. It's that nice. You end up telling him more because he does it in such a nice way, and it's more of a chat. It's not a questions and answers session. Um, so if you can get to that level, um, you're a long way down the road, I would say. Um, That's nice I, of you to say, Stephen. It's almost as if you've been programmed to say that. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I was just I was just going to add something else that I do, which works for me, is sometimes to, to manage my um, biases that will kick in, is I often think, and I often say this on train courses, think about if this was a member of your family. Yeah. If you wanted to know more from them, you wouldn't go in with a list of questions. You'd sit, That's you'd right. listen, you'd listen to the questions, and you'd exactly. want to ask and chat things through with them and check that they're okay. And it's that empathetic listening which makes a difference between a good investigation and just a almost a police question and answer session. So um, hopefully those the sharing those experiences uh, would help you when you think about your next planning. But in terms of planning, Jen's been extremely patient. What we're gonna have a quick look at is, um, we're just gonna have a quick look at our uh, planning uh, tab one, I think we've got here. And you'll see how this comes into practice, hopefully. Can you see that? No. 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 It's a grey screen at the moment. And now we can see you. How fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. what we're doing, what, yeah, perfect. Well, thanks, Jen. OK, so what we've done here is we've not listed all the issues. You know, there's two or three issues here. There's the, the, the deck that um, Bilal uh, makes a comment on. There's obviously the, the all hands on deck's comments and the Christmas party. But what you can see, if you look on the left hand side, is that we've identified the topics uh, the areas that we would want to talk about. And we've broken those down into those three categories. What actually happened? Then we've got the second category on the left-hand side is um, the, what the rules and the questions we would ask around that. And then we get down to the surrounding circumstances. But what I also want you to see is that now you can see how this planning works because once you've identified those three areas, you should then think about across the top there, who is it that I might need to speak to? OK, you know, you might not need to speak to all of those people, but they're your starting point. A question I often ask in, in any um, interview is, is there anybody else that you think I need to speak to? Is there anybody, are there any other documents you wish me to look at? But my starting point is always along the top line here. So it's a grievance. We obviously speak to the aggrieved person first of all. We've got an accused, but we'll probably speak to them at the end when we've gathered the rest of the evidence. And there's a few other people that we need to speak to as well. So that's our starting point. Now that list might expand. Um, it may not expand, um, but it's not fixed. It's just a, a starting point. This is how do I, where do I start? Who do I need to speak to? And what do I need to raise with them? Now, some of these questions on the left-hand side, as you will see when we go through this, won't be relevant to some of those witnesses, but you'll see the importance of the planning because we're thinking of the end result, which is our report. If you get a, a, a response from Deck, you then get a response from Jude. Balau or Alex might give you one piece of information which tips the balance as to whose evidence you prefer. And that's where we're talking about this planning now all makes sense. And it doesn't just get you to the end report. It actually helps you show the workings of your conclusions and how you get off that fence. OK, and there's not always a science to it. Sometimes, you know, I know I've walked into Ab's office and and other colleagues have done, and we just bounce things off things. And you see, Ab thinks of things slightly differently sometimes. Use that experience within your HR teams. Use that experience with the managers, um, but show your workings as to how you get to somewhere. Um, Ab, is there anything else you would add? Uh, apart from the documents, the documents I always put down the left-hand side. Uh, sometimes I, I put that to the left-hand side, just that I know which witnesses I'm going to ask about those documents, whether it's relevant, relevant to any questions. But it doesn't matter where it is. It's, it's important that you've got it on your planner. So you know the question you're going to ask, whether the documents are going to apply to any particular individual. Um, Ab, is there anything else you put on your planning? Uh, well, first of all, I'm um, uh, really touched by how emotional people feel about spreadsheets. It's absolutely fantastic. That's the first thing. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I, no, I'm not really got anything, anything to add. I think having um, a document that, um, has this type of information on is just important because ultimately when you get to the end of the process and you come to write the report these are the things which you will want to address in the narrative of the report so it really helps you 
to structure what you're going to deliver at the end. Um, and of course, as you've said, Stephen, it's useful also when you're doing the investigation itself. Like I say, I wouldn't have this in front of me when I was doing a meeting. Um, I think it clutters my mind just a bit too much. I do want that freedom of um, kind of, um, you know, opportunity just to chat with somebody. But I think it's a document that we all that we all need. And, and yeah, making sure that we um, have a tab, uh, our tab G or, or, or column G to ensure that we identify evidence other than oral evidence from individuals. So whether it be documents, whether it be video evidence, whether it be, you know, a policy document, whether or not it be, you know, a film on a camera or a text message or what have you, all of that would have come out in conversation because, you know, it may well be that Jude says, well, I texted um, um, Deck afterwards and, and he seemed all right. He didn't seem to have a problem with anything that had happened 10 minutes earlier. Then we know that we want in that column, um, have we obtained text from, from Jude or what have you. So yeah, all very important to keep track of um, what we're doing, where we're going in and, and staying within scope as well helps you stay within scope because if mm. you're going down an, a route or a line that doesn't have any bearing on 1.1 or 1.2 then we know we're wasting our time we're doing something that isn't going to help us and often that's what kind of contaminates people in their investigations they get kind of lost in kind of detail that that doesn't matter we all do that i'm not you know that that's possible for everybody so this just helps to keep you on track in focus on task yeah okay. it, it goes back to that point about the remit isn't it remembering what your remit is what are you actually investigating rather than getting lots of all the information and, and going off at tangents yeah so uh, yeah okay um, we, I saw a question come up about the other tabs. You'll see that we're going to work through these tabs as we build the evidence. So we will come through that and, and um, we'll go back to that in a, in a moment. Uh, one thing I want to go on to before we talk about um, the evidence, we've done the planning now effectively, but I think one of the most important things is how we question people, how we meet with people. And, and Abs led us into that conversation about in the cafe over a coffee sort of discussion. But the opening is really, really important. I can't emphasize this enough. If I go into somebody and say to them, well, what's your relationship like with DEC? Um, we can't, we haven't got time to go into it here, but when we do our deliver the investigations training, we talk about the psychology of this and the, and the brains that people can go in and out of, um, but it will trigger a defensive response is probably the easiest way of summing it up. And once you trigger that, you'll find that your um, ability to uh, elicit further relevant information will be extremely limited because people are on guard and they'll be so busy thinking, oh, I've got to be careful what I've got to say that they won't tell you key bits that could be actually in their favor and could tip the balance one way or the other. So it's the opening um, that's really, really important. Introduce yourselves. You may know each other, you may not. They may know who the note taker is. They may have brought somebody with them, but introduce yourselves. It sounds um, very, very basic, but you'll be surprised at how many people, well, thanks for joining us. And they go straight into hard questioning thank them i always say thank you for coming thank you for taking the time to come because again psychologically it flips the switch you're relaxing the atmosphere they don't want to be there any more than you probably do sometimes but just by thanking people it flicks a nice switch so the opening and explaining what's going to happen why we're here they understand the issues that you're going to be addressing with them you're going to explain the order and the way that you're going to do that also enables you to keep control of the meeting Sometimes people are so keen to tell you everything because of their emotions, whether they're in a defensive mode or an aggressive mode, they'll just steam ahead and give you so much information you won't be able to keep up. Your pen will be setting light to the paper. What you need to do is just keep control of that meeting, set things out, explain to them how the meeting is going to be undertaken, how you're going to structure your questions, um, and then the housekeeping, which is all very natural. And then are we ready to go? It's a nice, simple thing. Have you understood what we're going to do, how we're going to do it? Get to a yes if you can, because again, it's a psychological. Once you flick that yes, they're cooperating with you. So when you open, you, you go in with your first question, again, the cooperation there. But I think the opening and the closing are two areas which 
really get rushed or forgotten. And the closing is as important because one thing I mentioned both at the beginning and at the end is confidentiality. We're very keen to tell people not to contact people if they're suspended, etc. But it's nice to remind people is to say, look, I've not made you any judgments. I would ask that you keep this confidential. If there's anything you wish to add or you want me to speak or anybody you want me to speak to, please bring that to my attention. I give them somebody else they can speak to if they can't speak to me for some reason. But I will talk, talk about confidentiality at the beginning and at the end. The reason being is, A, then I don't forget to cover it, but B, they're listening to me normally at the beginning. They're listening, their ears are open. Whereas at the end and they feel like, oh, thank God I've got that off my chest or they're in defense mode. Their ears sometimes can be closed. So make the points at the beginning and repeat them at the end. Um, and then any closing comments, I, I've just got a couple of questions I always ask. Is there anything else you want to add? Is there anybody else you wish me to speak to or you think I need to speak to? And is there any other documents you think that I need to look at? Just then, it just limits the room for, for them coming back saying, well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, and the appeal later. Update them as to where you are, the next steps, the notes, get them, give them a chance to review those notes. If, uh, always take the time to do that. It feels like a half an hour, 45 minutes, or send the notes to them afterwards before you start um, going ahead. And we'll talk about how you change those and amend those in, in our investigation call. But make sure those notes are agreed if you can. If they're not, make a note that they've refused to sign, but they had the chance. And then again, just that civil approach at the end. It's, n it's not a, a nice experience very often, but thank people for their time. Thank them for coming. And they will then be warming to you. And it's this relationship which is important. Whether they're the accused or whether they're grieved, the maintaining relationships is really, really important. And I think those points, we don't actually go into the opening and closing because of time today, but you'll see when Ab is, um, we've got those, those excerpts from the interviews Ab does, his relationship with the person he's speaking to isn't any different with the accused or the or the um, uh, the person um, that's raised the agreements, the agreed person. It's just a good, open relationship. Ab, I've flown through that. Um, I'm sure there's lots more you could say, um, but is there any other key points you would add to any of those sections? Just um, the 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 the. Um... Well, first, of all, let, let me address Le Leslie's uh, comment. Comment. Leslie says um, that at the end, it's um, you know important from her perspective um, to um, ask how the meeting has gone. I think that is really, really helpful um, because um, people will want to tell you how the meeting has gone. So inviting them to do so is really. Is really is a really good point, and I think it really does bring the meeting to a close in a constructive way. And of course, you record anything and um, respond to anything that you know might be worth responding to in that respect. And then, secondly, just at the beginning, you know, overwhelmingly, I've been doing this for a long time, over thirty years, and what I find is to to make sure you get people wanting to talk. And I've never had anyone refuse refusing to 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 continue a meeting with me never not once in, in in 30 odd years of doing this and one of the things that i find is that if you start the meeting asking questions about the individual you're talking to so how's your, how's your day gone i bet this is the last thing you want to do today but you've got loads to do people's comfort zone is talking about what they know best and people know themselves best they know best what they are doing on that day. So if you have that just in the kind of warm up in the opening, you already get people talking. And then when you get into the meat and um, the gravy of the meeting, the substance of the meeting, they'll keep on talking. That's what I inevitably find. So yeah. that's just a little tip that uh, I'd recommend. Yeah, um, and I think it's one of those as well. If you close the meeting, it doesn't need to be uh, hours. Everything it's just good. Okay, um, it's just something. In what you know, what they're going to do next after the meeting? How they're going to get home? Are they going back into the workplace? You can have turn it back into a general conversation, so it smooths out the end rather than the hard end to the meeting. And again, that just maintains relationships. But uh, yeah, all good tips there. There's a couple of questions here as well. I can see someone asks. Um, Jill asks. What if someone says no comment to every question? Well, of course, it's their right to do so. So I think um, the first thing that I would do is recognize, I think you're right to, to say no comment. Um, and uh, 
you know, if that's, um, you know, what you have to say, what you're going to say in relation to every comment, then just, then just let me know. Um, I'd say, um, well, we're here and we know what we're here for. Um, it's about getting an understanding of what's happened. And, you know, if you're satisfied that no comment will help me get an impression of what's happened, then I can understand why you'd say no comment. Um, I find that tends to then start a conversation about why no comment. <laughs> and that in itself then helps to overturn the no comment stance. Because if ultimately you move to a point where you're effectively saying to the person, well, you know, look, if you're not going to help, we may as well finish. The fact that they have turned up means that they usually have something to say. So when they've got that contrasting kind of observation, I just find that it does open up the, um, the dialogue. And, you know, therefore, I've never had a no comment interview. I've had a no comment start to an interview, but I've never had a no comment interview because we discussed the no comment um, kind of mindset quite naturally. Well, okay, you're going to do no comment, then I assume that you've got nothing to say. But well, I have got something to say. Well, no comment won't help me understand what it is. Um, so, you know, let's see how we go on with the next question. Don't let it get you back up is the main thing. And, um, you know, stay you know, kind of cool, calm, focused on, you know, what it is you want to get out of the meeting. Um, but inviting someone to end the meeting that they, you know, seem to want to attend because no one is forced to attend the meeting. Um, you know, they often then kind of see the conflict in, you know, behavior. And, uh, yeah, we'll get them talking. We have ways of making people talk all the time. It's the bright light behind you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, um, I I have to say I, I've been down in Bristol over the last month or so and that's that question's come up twice and I think what it is is that they're seeing these police interviews on TV where you've got the solicitor in the room under a police interview and the, the young lad or somebody's just sitting there looking down at their knees saying no comment no comment that's all about what we've just said you set the right atmosphere you set the right relationship they've turned up it's more of a problem when people don't turn up. It's more common for them not to try and turn up or to avoid the meeting or delay the meeting or go sick than no comment. No comment really doesn't come up as often as you think in the investigation uh, in an employment field, in my experience. Have we got time to take another couple of questions from the chat, Stephen? There's, there's two here of interest. If we deal with them briefly, because we are tight for okay. time. We were going to deal okay. with questions at the end, but let, let's, let's deal with those quickly. So we've got um, Joanne. Um, hi, Joanne. What if they say I don't remember? Well, of course, if someone doesn't remember, they don't remember. What I often do is, depending on the nature of um, the issue, what lies behind the question, I you know, might ask, is it the kind of thing that you ordinarily would remember? Or another kind of um, you know, version of, of that is, is that the kind of thing that happens to you every day <laughs> that causes you not to remember it? So it will often depend what the issue is, but just kind of, again, tempting people out to say, well, you know, we're talking here about whether someone, you know, belted someone over the head. Is that the kind of thing that happens every day that causes you, you know, to kind of, you know, not remember it as, a, as an event? People then start thinking, and then, oh, no, well, no, I can't say that. So maybe I can remember a bit more. So it's just tempting it out. And then the second question that we've got here from Ella is, what if the witness discloses facts on um, a condition? Oh, oh, yeah, on a condition that they insist on remaining anonymous. So anonymity, I think, is the kind of general. Again, in the majority of cases that I've dealt with, witnesses always, even if they come into the meeting saying that they want anonymity, often leave the meeting saying, no, it's okay, I, you can place this on record because we talk about the impact of anonymity and the reality of anonymity. So in terms of the reality of anonymity, I, I kind of have this thing of saying, no one will really care about you. <laughs> so knowing about you won't matter because I'm seeing 27 people 
you're going to be one name in 27. I'm not sure why your name would stand out more than anybody else's. Um, and I also say that overwhelmingly in my 30 years of experience, I've never known a witness who um, has um, lifted their anonymity and be disadvantaged in any way. So what is it that you think will be um, kind of relevant in this case that will be of a disadvantage to you? And if they've got something real material and substantial, then sure, they need the support of me and the organization to keep their anonymity, but that's very rare. Very you can rare. normally, I'd agree. You can, once you have the conversation and again, the reassurances, the, 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 the short answer as well is legally, anonymity can't be guaranteed. Um, mm -hmm. There are exceptions during the investigation, as there was the leading case on this, where uh, there was gangland stuff going on outside, but the, the company had to investigate whether there was reasonable grounds for the fear, and it proved that there was, and in that case, but it was such an extreme example. Rarely would you, rarely would anonymity be required. Um, and in reality, as I've said, is um, there's no real disadvantage in every advantage, but putting your name to something actually gives weight to the evidence as well. Um, yes. There is one question about Lauren popped up, which is what do you do if they refuse to attend the investigation? Well, it's their opportunity. It's a bit like a disciplinary. I think you would, first of all, establish a reason. It, you know, if somebody's had an accident, that things happen in life. But if there are just being awkward and avoiding it, you give them a couple of chances and then you base your decision on the information available. Um, but that's the short version of that. Ab, did you have another one very quickly? No, well, turning up and giving evidence in an investigation is what I would call a civic duty. You know, it, it, it on very few employers will have it as a rule that someone has to participate in an investigation. Very few em employers in some professions, it's expected, you know, healthcare professionals would be expected to assist investigations about, you know, patient care, patient safety, et cetera. Um, but yeah, mostly it is an individual choice. So all I do and all the organizations who handle this best do is um, kind of explain why it's important and um, then, you know, lead people to make their decision. But yeah, if someone doesn't want to turn up, you know, you can lead a horse to water and all that kind of thing, but, you know, you can't stick their head in the pool and make them drink. Absolutely. Rachel, I saw your question come up. We're going to come on to the report later. So um, we will have a section for questions at the end. But what I want to do is just move move forward if we may at this stage. So we're not ignoring the questions. We will deal with those at the end. One technique that we do talk about, you'll often see this without constructive feedback, is the response I even got yesterday when we were doing some investigation. It's not, this isn't what this sandwich is about. It's closed, open and closed questions. So the way to do this and the way to keep control of a meeting and to actually control your evidence as you build it up for your report is to, con is to deal with each area uh, and each topic with a closed and open and a closed question. We'll go into detail you know, in, in the training that we give, but in short, I would just say, right, for the first point I want to focus on is the Christmas party. Are you understanding that we're just focusing on that point? We'll come to the others later are you understanding that we're focusing on the Christmas party? And they would either give me a yes or no answer. That's what a closed question is. They can only say yes or no. It's the open and filling questions in the middle where we were then start with our open questions. You start with a very broad question. So, you know, um, how, you know, could you explain to me uh, how you got to the Christmas party? And they would just explain how they got there. That would relax them. And then I'd wrote another open question about, okay, just explain to me how, how did it come about that, you were behind deck here in the conga um, and let them explain that. And then you'd open specifically, what did you say? Whereabouts were you exactly when you, with, when you were alleged to be talk, talking to him? How close were you to him? So those questions are still how, why, when, and what. And at the end, my close question is, okay, my understanding of what you've told me, if I've understood this correctly is boom, 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 boom. Have I understood that correctly? And they'll say, yes, or yes, that's, that's roughly right. Or no, I just want you to understand this bit. And I'll say, well, thanks very much. I'll make a note of that. And then I go on to the next section, right? The, the comment about um, deck, the, the, the decking. And we're gonna talk about that now. So it helps you keep control. It structures it rather than you getting a ramble about everything. So the sandwich is really, really important. Something that we focus on when we deliver our training, but um, you'll see this now. Uh, I'm keen to get to the videos just to, to gain some time back. But what you'll see is that we're going to interview deck. Well, I say we, that's the Royal we. Ab is interviewing deck. Now, you have to assume that the opening has been done and we'll do the closing. And we've taken an excerpt of one area that we're asking about here. So 
Um, what we'll do is we've broken the interview with Deck down into four clips. So we'll just go on to clip one and have a quick discussion about that when you're ready, Jim. So you um, talk in your grievance about this all hands on um, deck um, comment. So um, was it the first time you heard that um, in this new, in this, well, this job you've now been in for two years or was that one of the old jokes about your name? Uh, yeah, it's something that's again is that that's that's one that, that I've heard I heard before joining. Yeah, yeah. And in relation to that particular comment, you know, how have you generally reacted to it? How do you typically react to that one? Yeah, it's something that um, it's something that you, you just get used to. I mean, I guess it sort of made me stand out on occasion. People tend to recognize my name when they can put a put a comment to it like that and so um it's something that's that sort of spread about yeah sounds like it made you popular if anything uh, <laughs> i mean i like to think it's slightly slightly more than just my name but i suppose yeah. it it helps it helps being introduced to people yeah okay okay Okay, so that's quite a short start to 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 the uh, the interview. But some of the things you may have noticed, and I was just making some notes myself. There is that you'll see immediately. This is a chat. This is smiles, conversations. Okay, I hear that. It's empathetic listening. So you'll see all the skills behind what Ab's doing. That's relaxing Deck as he's starting to talk. He's getting the positive answers, um, and it's the surrounding circumstances. There was no the rules say this. Um, why do you believe there's been a breach of the rules? It was a chatty conversation about, well, what's happened in the past? Is this something that's been acceptable to you? Is this something that's not been tolerable to you? But it's a nice, easy, over the coffee conversation, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, Ab, anything you would say? Because obviously it's your interview, the approach you were taking. Yeah, again, just um, I'd reinforce what I've already said. It's um, a kind of style that hopefully feels like it's not forced um you know we all have our kind of characteristics I, I can't believe how slowly I speak actually when I see myself on on, on film but um well there you go so so no it's just it, it is it's very much about bringing your natural personality empathy and 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 way out because that's when people will kind of be more drawn towards kind of working with you and cooperating with you yeah, one thing that struck me was it would be very tempting when I was, it was an allegation of harassment. Uh, it can be a very serious atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, and quite emotional at times. Yeah. But the number of times you smiled in that first clip, I don't know how long that was, but was it no more than two minutes? And it was a couple of smiles. It's that natural body language, which is you're relating with that person and, and, and again, encouraging it. He even think, I think he also sort of chortled himself. And that relaxed the conversation straight away. So think about your own behaviours and your own body language and how you can help them to relax. But a smile is a marvellous thing. And it wasn't false. It wasn't smiling and grinning like a Cheshire cat. But when something was naturally, something gave me the opportunity to smile, it was a nice smile. OK, yeah, I hear that. I understand that. So that good techniques to just observe there. So, Jen, if we could go to clip two, please. And what about um, the reaction of others? So you said that um, Alex and, and, and Jude... Um, have um, made um, that comment. So Alex first. What 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 what's his kind of reaction when it's when he says it or when it's it's said by anybody else? Yeah, I mean it, Alex probably just have a smirk on his face. You know, one of those like cheeky grins of uh, hey look here's here's this joke. Uh, Jude always laugh out loud. Always found it so funny um she never really seemed to get tired of it actually yeah 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 um do you think they, they got any sense of you being affected um by it did you think you were showing any affection um uh, that it was having any effect on you and do you get a sense of whether they recognize that i mean if I reacted at all to it, most occasions I'd just just smile, just bat it off. Like I say, it's something I've heard heard for a while now. 
Um, I mean, with Jude, there's obviously the the connection with the song. So sometimes uh, my response would be like, "Hey Jude, don't make me sad," and then that oh, yeah. just that get that get her going, and uh, yeah. we'd both be be sort of laughing at that point. And sometimes we'd just sort of uh, just sort of break out into song, yeah. So just give me a sense in relation to the all hands on comment. How many times did Alex and Jude um, say it? If you can kind of tell me individually, how many times Alex, how many times Jude? I mean, I wouldn't be able to put a number on it uh, every day, but it, it it was a sort of an everyday thing. Mm. Okay. I did note that you said that relationships within the team are you know, quite good, good atmosphere in, 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 in the team. And I know in your grievance that you say, um, you know, you didn't want to say anything to your colleagues, even though it was wearing you down a bit. And I just want to understand how those two things work together. If you're getting on okay with people and everything's, you know, hunky-dory, so to speak, then, you know, what's the issue with, you know, maybe saying, you know, that that's a bit tired, that one or something like that? I mean, I, I, um, I know, especially when I started, it was a, the, the, there was a case of not wanting to, to rock the boat. This is a team that had already been there. They already had a great atmosphere. And I didn't want to be that sort of killjoy who came in and started ruining things for people. I mean, it's a joke. Like I say, I've heard it a thousand times. So mm-hmm. it's something that I can still get on with my day and do and try and my own spin on it especially when i was working with jude but um i mean you, you just don't want to be that guy do you okay well I, I hear you i hear you really important words there it's not just listening and showing that he's listening and, and reacting to it but he's emphasizing that point by using the language i hear you i hear you i see that when somebody shows you something there it, it just helps that embed into their mind but what you'll see there is that on clip two, we've still not gone into hard what actually happened section. What are the surrounding circumstances section? They're very open questions about reactions. Um, he's not asked, was it unwanted? It's what was the reaction? How do you think they sensed this? Could you give me a sense of how many times this happened? These are your what, why, whens, how have you reacted? What was, what's been their reaction? But without the hard questions of an interrogatory interview, more of that coffee shop conversation. Um, but at the end, what I would do, and, and Ab's, Ab's more experienced than me on these matters, but what I tend to do is I would go back, I tend to adjourn at the end of an interview, and I would just quickly go through and have a quick scan through as they're talking about, have I covered all the questions in what actually happened? I'd almost be ticking them off mentally and on a piece of paper in my planner so that I make sure that I don't need to come back to them. Even though it's a general conversation, I can tick off the questions which I've addressed as part of that conversation. I don't need to go through quite as structured. That's something I think that comes with experience um, and confidence as you deal with more and more interviews and disciplinary and grievances. But this is a good example of Ab's experience coming through there. Um, Ab, is that a deliberate act or is that just something now that you tend to do to get to your what, your hows and your whys? Or, or do you actually drill down on people as you get further into the conversation? Um, well, I, look, the, the, I think that the, the main thing is giving people the space to tell their story in the way that they want to with their um, not just, you know, reciting a list of facts, but reciting, you know, how they felt, what they were seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling along the way because that gives you the most complete picture. And again, it encourages the dialogue, it encourages the um, um, responsiveness, it encourages um, the um, flow um, of a meeting because you know people are comfortable in that zone. So hopefully what is showing there is that all of the questions are really about giving Deck the opportunity to tell his story in the way that he feels it will best um, kind of represent, you know, his his case. Yeah, that, that that that's it. You know, I'm sure some people could do do better. It's you know, I I don't for one second say it's the only way, um, but um, all of that is consistent with 
kind of how, you know, I, from a personal point of view, want to make a connection with yeah. people. Yeah, I would, uh, something that struck me, and I, I think it's more because of the tribunal and the advocacy side of things, something that was uh, leaping out at me on, on that interview was that you were asking about the unwanted conduct and had it been reported, how you how you reacted to these things being. Now, what you didn't ask was, well, did you report this? You didn't go further and make it more interrogatory. You actually knew when to stop. You'd got the answer. You got the, the idea of what had happened in the past and how far it had gone. Uh, and obviously we talk about the psychology of things when we do this, the investigation training, but um, something I think is really important is you can get the answer without having to ask the hard nosed question, um, which, and I think clip two really emphasized that for me, but um, let, let, let's move forward. We will go on to, 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 clip, to clip three here, um, but there you'll see the sandwiches coming into play. I think if I remember rightly. So yeah, sorry, Jen, I was talking a bit too much there. Um, so you said that there were other jokes. It wasn't just just that one. Um, so um, let's deal first with this um, deck outside um, comment that Bilal um, made. Mm. Um, firstly, do you think that it, that was a play on words for you, or was that comment from Bilal anything to do to do with you at all? No, I mean I don't think I don't think Bilal meant anything by it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So obviously just telling us about about his life. Okay, but then you say Alex made this comment about um, the deck outside and not good for you, etc., uh, etc. Et yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did he kind of deliver deliver that one, and, and and how did you react? Let me get two questions in for the price of one. I mean, I I suppose he was quite quick with it, and. Yeah, it did catch me off guard. So um, I, I did find it funny uh, when it was first said. It was something that I've not uh, not heard before, but um, I did. I did stop laughing before he did. Okay. What was the reaction of anyone else that you can remember? Jude was. I think Jude was there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the others. Um, the others. They both. They both laughed as well. Bill Allen, Jude, but. But it was Alex who just sort of found himself incredibly funny, but I must, I must say. Yeah. And one of those who thinks his jokes are the best. Yeah, yeah. And then because I'd sort of stopped laughing, it kind of felt like everyone was sort of just laughing at me instead of mm -hmm. laughing along with me. And it, it, uh, um, uh, it just sort of moved, moved, moved across. And I mean, Jude, uh, she she definitely was the loudest. Um, her jokes te tend to be typically a bit more juvenile mm -hmm. um, than than anyone else's. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for helping with that one. Um, should we move to the Christmas party? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that that clip for me is the emphasis there is. Uh, the skill of the closed open close. So you saw at the beginning there, I've asked two closed questions. It doesn't have to be a hard piece of bread. You could have two layers of bread, a bit like your uh, 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 McDonald's where you have the extra bread in the middle. You can have a closed question followed by another closed question where he talked about Bilal and then he asked a closed question in relation to Alex. Um, you then heard the open questions and then I, I picked up there was two hows, how this, how reaction. And then another closed question at the end was about the person that seems to think their jokes are the funniest and you've got a yeah yeah and behind that yeah yeah was another piece of important information which was um it was how it made him feel that he's being laughed at not with so just by having that sandwich it was really clear in that clip three is a couple of closed questions open questions and then going down to a closed question and right at the end what you saw then was he closed it and moved to the next section which we described at the beginning which was should we talk about the christmas party yeah, yeah. So again, it's very clear in his mind, I've closed that section down. It's not to say you can't come back to it, but you've closed that down. You're now going to a topic. You're helping to focus the, the interviewee's mind so that they're clear of what they're doing. And we could talk about that in chronological order. And if you've got that, that's going to make your report easier because you're going to say point one is this, point two is the Christmas party. And you've dealt with that chronologically and your conclusions will flow from the information you get on that. So 
really good example of of, of uh, the closed open close sandwich that. Um, I just the, yeah the the, the um, using um, kind of close and open questions in the kind of right sequence and kind of the right um, quantity to some extent. If you note the close questions are all kind of pointing towards areas where there is likely or unlikely to be any dispute. The areas that aren't particularly controversial is what the close questions tend to be aimed at. So Jude was there, yeah. Um, the, the, you get an instinct as an investigator as you're going through an investigation as to what's likely to be in dispute, what's unlikely to be in dispute. So to kind of keep the conversation turning over, you use the closed questions for those things which are unlikely to be in dispute, but still make it a complete picture. So you're getting confirmations on things that you've already got a fair idea are likely to be um, uncontroversial. The open questions, you'll note, are kind of more directed towards the things which might be in dispute, which might be a bit more controversial. So how did it make you feel? It made me feel awful because, whereas you know that there might be evidence coming somewhere down the line as, you know, with someone saying, well, Jude, um, Deck never kind of bothered about that. He was laughing as much as everybody else. So those open questions tend to be, made, tend to be more directed towards um, controversy than um, non-controversy, if, if that makes sense. It does. It's perfect sense, and it's um, it, yeah, it's something I hadn't observed myself. Ab, but when you put it that way, it's, it sounds obvious, but actually, it's very important to 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 have that understanding, not to lead people in the direction that you want, but where it's an area of dispute or uh, that requires clarification. Let them come out with the information, and then ask the further questions that flow from that. There's just a question here. Somebody's made the obvious point, um, and it's because of the type of training we're doing here is there's no note taker. Ab's not taking notes. Uh, I would highly recommend, Ab is super, super skilled. Um, but I think if you're not experienced in doing these investigations, if you have the opportunity to have a note taker, have a note taker, you will have said, as Ab was asking those questions, I was doing notes here for myself to talk to you about. So have a note taker if at all possible. And the reason being is it's quite a fine skill to be able to keep on track within your remit and ask the question that you want, listen to the answer and think about the other questions that are flowing from that answer and to write notes. Um, you will drop one of those unless you are extremely experienced in doing that. So uh, to Lauren's point, if you can have a note taker, always record the notes. They don't have to be verbatim is the next question uh, that we'll address straight away. As long as they record what was roughly asked and what was the rough answer, that's sufficient. Um, don't worry about every I being dotted and every full stop being in. Um, but what I would say is get those notes typed up as soon as you can after that meeting, if you can't type them at the time. Um, on that, I'm just going to do a pause. It's just gone 11. I'm going to ask everybody, don't switch off and log out, but just switch your cameras and your mics off. And what we'll do, come back in at 10 past 11. So it's given us just under 10 minutes. Grab your view, check your emails. And if you could all be back at 10 past sharp, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Well, we kept you in a bit of suspense. Um, we're going to now have a quick look at clip four. Um, really what I want you to focus on here is how... Um, Ab approaches the um, sensitive question of the sexuality, the sexual nature of the allegations. And again, uh, watch, there's no direct question, but he does have to probe a bit harder on this. Um, but it's important how um, how he does that. It's the how that I really want you to say to go, take away from this clip. So, Jenna, if you've got back up to speed, that would be great. OK, so I just want to get a sense of how things were going on. Um, the night of the Christmas party before, um, you know, the incident that we're going to talk about. What what was it like for you that night? I mean, yeah, it started off really good. Um, I was sat on a on a table with some people that I'd not not met too many times before, so it was really good to to meet sort of the wider team. Um, when we got the opportunity after after we'd sort of eaten, um, I sort of mingling with everyone else and no yeah it was it, it, it was a really good time um uh, at the start yeah so so it sounds like you're enjoying yourself yeah is it fair, fair yeah, yeah 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 that's, that's that's fair 
And you say you hadn't had much to drink. I just want to get a sense of what you actually did drink, if you can help me with that. Yeah, so so I was I was driving, um, and so I wasn't drinking at all. I'd actually uh, um, I had actually saying that I had I had asked for orange. Um, I was offered sort of the champagne with with my meal. Mm-hmm. And and did you take the champagne with your meal? Um, I, I had I had a sip or so, but yeah. like I said, I was driving, so I didn't want to okay. didn't want to go too uh, too much with that. Okay, no, that that, that that's uh, that's helpful. And what was the kind of nature of conversation like? Was it you know office like? Was it um, straying into kind of social life? Did it um, get in any way more edgy? Just give me a sense of of that please uh there was nothing nothing that crossed the line it was a bit of a mix between between work and social like i say it was uh my first time well, not my first time but it was it was i know first time sort of being able to have an extended period with some people so it was just really uh, really interesting to hear hear what they had going on okay okay so we get to this um, this conga. I'm not sure everyone loves a conga, but uh, there you go. I suppose it's all personal taste. Um, so, had you been dancing um, before the conga came on? Um, I mean, a, a little bit. <laughs> to say dancing is not really my thing. Um, so I tend I tend to be the kind of one who hangs towards the outside, hoping that no one sort of realizes how bad I really am. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So when the conga um, came on, then where where, where were, you, were you? Were you on the dance floor or um, uh, around the side of the dance floor? Um, so I was I was around the side, but then I saw that everyone else was getting involved and thought, um, I should probably get involved myself just to not stand out, really. Okay. Um, so were you going to join? the conga were you intending to join it uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah i was okay. so at what point does um jude come into the picture and where, where are you and what are you doing at that point um so i I'd, I'd, I'd gone on for a little bit um then uh sort of realized that i wanted to wanted to leave so I sort of exited my place and was was leaving off Okay. Uh, to just gather my things and uh it was jude who came up came up to me uh as i was trying to actually just just leave the place mm-hmm. um yeah. then uh she she sort of grabbed me on my way to try and beckon me back towards towards the dance floor and, and that's when she she sort of whispered in my ear it is all hands on deck now okay I know this is really difficult because you're not Jude, um, but um, you know you say in your grievance that you know it had a sexual overtone. So I just want to get a sense of what that sounded like, and you know why you felt it was a sexual overtone. I don't, I don't know how good a mimic you are, so um, but I, I, I do need to get some sense of what made it um, sexual for you. Yeah, I think it was the uh, it was the it was the way she said it, and it was it was what she said. Um, she obviously she had she had she had grabbed me by the waist at that point, and uh, she she whispered it into my ear that uh, it it's all hands on deck now, instead of saying oh come on deck come back and come back and join or or trying to do anything like that. I mean I I know she'd had a few drinks by that yeah. point as well. I don't know if that had any any effect on what she was doing Mm -hmm. yeah forgive me if i just push you a touch because all hands on deck is something that you'd heard many times from what i understand so Mm. if i can put it this way and tell me whether i'm in the right place the words themselves i don't think you had regarded as sexual prior to that moment or tell me if i'm right or wrong so, no, no, no. You, no, you, you're right. You're right. Prior to this, to this incident, yeah. So, 
what was it specifically that on that night in that way that made you kind of take this extra dimension f from it like i said i don't uh, i can't ask you to mimic but if you want to um give me some sense yeah. of how it was delivered that that would really help me yeah i mean i think as well you, you gotta you gotta understand she had her hands on me yeah um the, the the common joke is all hands on deck and on this occasion she she said with with her hands on me she said well it is all hands on deck now uh, and i think it was it's that sort of change to it and and with the context of everything else that was going on that i was trying to trying to leave and uh it, that's that's just the way I took it in that in that moment. Okay, no, that's, that's helpful. If you, just um, forgive me if um, I sound like I'm playing devil's advocate, but that's sometimes part of an investigator's role. Obviously, I'm not I'm not spoken to anybody else yet, but I'm just trying to think about what someone could possibly say. And if you know, I, um, say to you, well, putting hands on somebody in a conga isn't usually regarded as a sexual act um it's something that you've done five minutes earlier so i'm trying to get this sense of why it was putting hands on you specifically with coupled with the comment that you'd not previously regarded as a sexual comment that turns it into something sexual i mean am i, am I missing something here or no, I mean, I think, I mean, it was, it was just, it was the fact as well. I wasn't actually in the conga at that point. Right. I was trying to, I was trying to leave the, okay. leave the event. It was, it wasn't just, it wasn't just the hands on, on me. It was the hands and, and the whispering in my ear. Okay. That it just, it just made me feel uncomfortable. Okay. That, 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 that's, um. I, I, I understand the thing where where you're coming from. Um, so um, once um, she does that, just um, if you can um, tell me to finish off what it is that you then then did and kind of what she would have seen and understood of your reaction. Oh, I just I just said um, I said that I, I I had to leave now and sort of brushed her brushed her off and, and got my jacket and, and left. Um, so le le left the event altogether? Yeah, I left the event altogether and just drove home. Um, as you were doing that, did you see what her reaction to your reaction was? No, I just I just wanted to get out of there. Okay. Really. Um, and then finally, have you seen Jude since? Uh, a couple of times, but I've sort of kept my distance a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. I think there's so much in that clip. We've left that rhyme rather than break it into pieces because it actually showed you the flow of the questioning. Every question and every answer led to another couple of questions. And what was important in that one is you saw that the information that came out in clip one and two have then turned around and, and introduced that in order to establish the perception of the sexual connotation to this this is what had changed um you know this had happened i think uh deck said earlier you know thousands of times before many times before as, as ab had put it in there so connecting what has now been said to you to the 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 serious serious allegation um and understanding what had changed and and just by allowing him to talk you saw there was a change in the land it wasn't just all hands on deck it was it is all hands on deck now so there was a change in the, the language, even though it appeared to be the same language, it wasn't exactly the same. And then just establishing specifically what happened, how far away was she when she whispered in his ear um, and so forth. So you could see a classic of everything coming together there where using the information you had, listening to the answers, drawing out more, getting the detail. Even when he said he left, obviously he left, he didn't, Ab didn't assume he left that area or left the, the thing, it's obviously left, he clarified, you, you know, what do you mean by left? So again, and then we drove down to, so 
it got down to the specific, specifics of yes, no, um, and so forth. So good clip there showing how you put it all together. Ab, um, what I noticed there is there wasn't any direct questions. You go, you pushed them uh, two or three times there. Um, do you find it's necessary to do that with lots of witnesses or was this just a case of you weren't getting the answers that, or the clar clarity that you wanted? Um, ultimately, the investigator has to um, extract evidence and that's really important. We can never forget that no matter how personable we want to be. <clears throat> we've got to get a full understanding of the picture. I often find that the best way to do that is to replay someone's words back to them if ultimately what they have said so far doesn't complete the picture. So, so you just told me this, just help me understand what that means in relation to the next thing. So is that kind of always building up the, the, that, that person's storyline, not my version of it, but their version of it. So you're kind of, you know, always kind of asking them to, you know, look at the last brick that they that they laid and then see what they want to put on top of that last brick. So, OK, so you've just told me that she whispered in your ear. What was it about that which for you in these particular circumstances felt sexual? OK, so you just said it was about the phrase all hands on deck. That's something that you've heard before why is it that the words themselves on this occasion took a different connotation? So it's always their evidence. I've, I've not really introduced anything. I've, I've just given them what they've said and asked them for a bit of clarification and asked them for a bit of clarification. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, my, my, my um, kind of um, experience is that people seem more comfortable with that, I'm not trying to catch you out, I'm just trying to give you the opportunity to tell me the next thing in the sequence, okay? Um, and if you're asking a question that does sound like you're trying to catch you, catch them out, because it will do, you know, subjectively, it doesn't matter what I think, what matters what, is what they think. You'll see that I almost um, apologise for it. So, look, I've got to play devil's advocate because that's mm. part of my role, mate. Yeah. So and, just and tell sorry. me. Yeah, and sorry yeah. to push you. Sorry to push yeah, you on that. You're apologizing right. as well. Yeah, that's right. Because you know, it, it's just it's just my job now. But this is what I've got to do, even if it does seem like I'm getting a bit heavy. I'm not. I'm just doing my job. Basically, is um, you know what I'm trying to convey there. And hopefully, that then just um, you know gives it you know a slightly different feel. Yeah. One thing I'd ask everyone to note before we go on to, to, to hearing the other side of this is um, when you do the investigations, a bit like tribunal hearings, you always feel it's going one way and you feel quite strongly. But remember, we've only heard one side. Uh, there was a question in there about drinking, which I'm not going to go into details, but we'll, I want you to, to remember that question was asked because that's relevant to what we'll come on to later about balancing the evidence and whose evidence you prefer. But um, for now, what I'd like to do is just have a quick look at tab two on our spreadsheet and our investigation report and what you'll see is we're not writing all the minutes that we've written down here we've got the minutes we'll have appendix when we draft our report um deck statement will be the appendix one or appendix six whatever it is we can refer to the detail in that but what you can see is where we've asked the questions what did happen we're putting in a summary of those points so what happened what where was it what was relevant um, and if Jen just scrolls down slowly, you can just see to get an idea. I'm not going to read through each of these. You'll get a fair idea and it doesn't doesn't mean anything, but it's bullet points. OK, and you'll see how we build this up as we go along. Perfect. OK, so brief key points, not every word that was said. That's all in the statement and the appendix. So this is this is just preparing your report. These are the phrases that you can put into your report to show your workings and how you got to your conclusion. So with that in mind and, and just giving Jenna a, a, a chance, what we'll do now is Jude is the main person who's been accused of these childish comments and placing their hands on, and whispering in the ear. So what we'll do now is we'll take the opportunity now. This isn't the full interview. This is just an excerpt 
of one area that we're doing just by way of example. So we'll listen to this clip and just see how you feel after this um, and whether there's anybody else you would need to speak to. So Jen, if you could just play that clip, that'd be great. So Jude, I think we just uh, got onto the subject of this conga. Yeah. So, um, did you join the conga? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, who, who, who did you join the conga with then? Um, so, so, well, there was quite a lot of us. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't remember everybody that was there, but... Who, who was your kind of front person, if that makes sense? Who's, uh, who, who, who are you um, gripping onto? Oh, Deck was in front of me. Okay. So, so how did you come to join the conga with deck then just tell me a bit about that so the the dj put the music on you know the one that you you know you, that you all get up to and, and do the conga and everyone was doing the conga and i said to deck oh come on you know let's let's join in um and so that's that's what we did okay and how did he seem was he a willing participant or did you get any sense of perhaps not being enthusiastic about it just tell me how it came over to you well, you know what a lot of blokes can be like, you know, they, they don't always want to go and do these kind of dances, do they? So they always need a bit of, you know, a bit of encouragement. It's, it's you know, the girls are much more likely to, to kind of do it. So, but, you know, blokes most of the time, they kind of then go with the flow. And so that's what Deck did. Okay. So, so um, when you um, kind of made... I don't know the introduction, the contact. Just um, tell me a bit about that. Did you say anything to him, or did he say anything to you? Remember exactly. You know, it, it would have been something like, "Come on, you know, let's 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 join in. Come on, you know." That that, that would have been along those lines. I can't remember the exact words, but that's what that's what I you know I can recall best of it. Um, there's some suggestion that there was an all hands on deck comment. Does that? ring any bells with you uh, yeah yeah it's, it's 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 something that we do all the time in the office you know it's it's just one of those one of those comments that gets used team meetings it's 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 used an awful lot where you know people go oh come on you know all hands on deck um and and so yeah I, you know I, I can remember you know kind of like oh you know here we go all hands on deck um because we were in the conga and it was hands on deck oh so that was that the point at which you put your hands on is waste presumably is that? that that's that's what you do when you're doing a conga okay. everyone, everyone grabs the, the person in front of them by the waist um, but it yeah. just so happened that you know with him being called deck it was just part of that that ongoing joke of you know ah hands on deck and as you said this to him uh, how close were you what 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 was the kind of physical kind of um you know connection at that point were you close to him were you um did you have to um lean into him or were you okay just saying it from a distance what how, how, how did that work obviously i was holding him you know by by the waist that is, yeah. is, you are with a conga and and you know that there was loud music mm -hmm. so you know i would have had to you know i can't i i, I assume that you know, i probably would have had to shout a bit to, to be heard or at least lean towards him and, and, you know, raise my voice so that he could hear me say it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have heard me say it. How close do you think you got to um, his ear? Did, 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 did you get, can you have any, do you have any recollection of that? That's really difficult to, yeah, to try and work out. But, you know, if you think about, you know, the hands were kind of there in his waist. So if I leaned forward a bit, then, mm. you know, probably my head was probably just behind his head. Mm. I would have mm. thought. Yeah. And can you give me any sense of how you said it? Because I'll 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 be um, you know blunt about it. It's being suggested that the way that you said this was, you know, had some kind of sexual overtones, some sexual connotation. So I really would be grateful if you could help me understand how you felt it was delivered. It was conveyed to him. I can't I can't imagine how anyone would interpret it in that way you know it was it's it was an on, ongoing joke everyone in the office would tell you you know people constantly used it it's all hands on deck um and that just happened to be another one of those occasions but it just so happened that my hands were on deck but how you could 
make that sound suggestive in any way and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a loss really because it, it was an ongoing joke it wasn't something that he'd never heard before can you think of why it might be said that it was kind of sexually suggestive and you know had those kind of con connotations you think of why um that might say that I, I really can't i really can't because it was it was just a joke i can't even begin to imagine how he would how he would interpret it that way it's, it's not something that i would want to give somebody the impression mm. of and certainly you know it's always just been a joke it's something we've all laughed about you know dex laughed about it in the past as well okay how did he react on this occasion how long did this uh conga go on for for him and and, and you as his kind of conga buddy i can remember um exactly you know it was yeah I, I can remember with you know just kind of dancing along for a bit i can't remember exactly how did how did it kind of come to an end i.e the link of the conga that you and him formed how did that come to an end he um yeah at some point he just kind of left the conga which is what people do you know usually they kind of wear themselves out a bit or mm. they start feeling you know quite often sometimes people feel a bit silly don't they after a while mm. the, the initial idea was sounding mm. like a good one and after a bit people kind of peter off so there's usually just a hardcore left doing it mm -hmm. um did he say anything to you or did you get any sense of you know how he seemed at that point no no so so he just he just got off literally yeah left i you. don't i don't I don't remember anything in particular about it. And uh, just one more question on this. Have you spoken to um, Dex since um, that uh, that night, that, that conga? Not really, no, because we, we don't really, you know, we don't have a lot, we don't have a lot of conversations in okay. the office, so there wasn't any, anything to talk about in particular, no. Okay, I'm really grateful. That's really helpful. Thanks. Okay, there's a few things about conga dancing in there for me, but put that to one side. Um, <laughs> um, what you could see there, again, Jen on the first one, when we looked at the interview with Deck, Jen works at Magic, just put open, closed, 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 open, open for us. But you can see again, there were at least two closed questions when he came to speak to Jude here. He talked about the Christmas party, then he drew the attention to the conga. And there were two yeses straight away. And then there was a range of open questions. But what was important was Jude was very matter of fact about it. And that was the skill of the interview here. There was no, you know, you could see that there's a sexual connotation or how this could be taken as a sexual connotation. It was sort of like, help me understand. Um, could you think why? So it's all about them. And as Ab's point before was, it's them giving the evidence, not you giving your views and for them to comment on they're giving you their comments and for you to ask questions upon um, and it's very easy to slip slip into giving views and asking them to comment on it rather than drawing out the evidence uh, and again a big distinction between an interview uh, and interrogation approach ab you seem to enjoy that one um but uh, anything you would say in the approach you take on this because it is a delicate subject here and it'd be very easy for somebody like you to go into a, a defensive mindset and sort of like fold their arms and not answer openly but there was a skill here where Jude just seemed to be just you know well, so what's wrong about this this is all, this is what happened um anything you do when you deal with these cases sexual racial any discrimination harassment victimization it, immediately people would be on the back foot if they knew they would come to talk about this how do you address that well first of all Jude was just singing like a canary wasn't she <laughs> she was fantastic it was absolutely great um yes. but um Look, what I um, took for, as I was kind of re-watching re it, it's the first time I've seen it, and um, it, it, it's the, what, what, what kind of struck me is the sequential way in which we work through the, the, the questioning. So establishing the basics. Did you join the conga? Was it with Jude? Because that's the what happens stuff. So let's get let's get into that. That gets I think that gets Jude talking because she's perfectly comfortable 
with those elements. And then it's okay, now that we've established that you did join the conga and it was with deck, then let's explore how that went, you know, where you put your hands, when you put his hand, your hands on him, um, when you made comment, all of that kind of thing. She's very, very comfortable with kind of just telling her story about all of all of those those things. And then, of course, we get into, like you say, the more challenging areas about how, you know, one is to regard the way in which she went about, um, you know, the making the comment and putting her hands on him and all that kind of thing. And the only thing that you can really do there ultimately is meet it head on. So look, it's not what I'm saying, but it's what is being said that you did it in this way. So you give me your version. And again, um, Jude, as many witnesses are, are quite keen to get their element of the story out. So it's just kind of prodding them, encouraging and, um, you know, giving them the, 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 the floor, literally, to, um, you know, say, say their thing. And then, of course, the key thing is you've now got all of that evidence in the can, all of those perceptions in the can, and ultimately you're going to have to weigh those up against other evidence you you've got on those on those subjects so it's all yeah. building towards you being able to start dissecting and um evaluating and uh, we'll talk about that in, in in a moment yeah we're just coming on to that so that's uh i don't know whether that was planned but perfectly smooth and actually we've just had a question there is somebody's just saying look what if somebody's uh not sending the truth there's no cctv or other witnesses um we're coming on to that now because this is the crux of it yeah Cases like this are often about perception, and we've seen how um, uh, questioned the and established how the perception actually comes to a reality, whether it was reasonable to have that perception or not. Um, so, um, what we'll do now, we'll go back to putting in the evidence that we've seen or now heard from Jude, and do the same summary, uh, and then we'll talk about conflicts of evidence and whose evidence you prefer. So, um, to go down there, um, as you could see uh, immediately on the first section. I can't really, I can't remember. The recollection of Jude, if you remember rightly, those are the phrases which I would get in there. I'm, you know, can't be absolutely sure, but this is it. Um, what I recall is there's a little bit more doubt in the evidence of Jude, and you will pull those phrases through. Um, I think if we then click on the next tab um, where we go into, I think we see Valau. You, we're not going to go through that interview, but then if you've got somebody that can give you some evidence, um, that might help tip the balance. But even without Valau here, I think on Jude's evidence versus Deck's evidence, um, there are certain things that may justify you going to one way or the other. Now, remember, you don't have to prove it, you're all, all reasonable doubt. You're not even having to say this definitely happened. As an investigator, you're just saying, look, has some, it, it does it appear something uh, may have happened that needs to be considered further a disciplinary action? Um, or is it just a recommendation that you're going to make in that, you know, won't take any action here, but maybe put some training in place? Those are the only sort of uh, reactions you're going to have. So no action at all. Go to a disciplinary for further consideration or recommendations or maybe some recommendations in, in addition to, to suggesting it goes forward. But there's only three, th really three stock areas that you're going to uh, come to a conclusion on. But let's ignore Bilal's evidence at the moment. What we're looking at is whether it satisfies the definition of harassment and whose evidence we prefer. So the drinking point. We've got evidence from somebody here that might have had a couple of sips of some champagne. There's nothing to suggest that they've been influenced by alcohol versus somebody who's had a few drinks and hasn't got very good recollection. You, as I say, as long as you've got your reasoning as to your preference for the evidence, that's fine. It's where you just suddenly say, you know, Having heard Dex evidence and Jude's evidence, I, I think this goes forward to disciplinary. Why? It's the why bit that's been missing. What is your connection uh, between those? So I'll give you an example that we had on a, a, a recent case we were revising on where um, three witnesses against the, the person the allegations are made against. And the concluding report was, I don't uphold the grievance. And HR rang me and said, mm, we're not sure because how can we have three people? And I said, 
no good asking me. You've got to go back to the investigator. And what it was was the evidence of the three individuals was so uh, exactly exact and it was so precisely the same. It was an it, the feeling was collusion. That wasn't in the investigator's report. So whilst they had a, a reasonable conclusion, they didn't show their workings. And that's the crux of it. So by building this up, as you can see, going across the page and then you'll see the definition of harassment, you will eventually get to a point where your conclusion should leap off the page. So in answer to the question that we had, um, it's not always clear why you prefer the evidence, but you need to find the reason as to why you're going one direction or the other. Ab, if I sum that up, succinctly enough or is there anything that you had from your experience um you know what you've got to excuse me because i'm just uh, helping um to um respond to some of the questions okay. um, in, in 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 the um in in the chat so just ask me that again so i was just saying in in terms of it's showing your workings that's important when you come to your conclusions it's it's you don't have to be there's no absolute right or absolute wrong sometimes but you've got to be able to support your you know, back your position and back your conclusion and show your workings is, is what I'm saying but is that your experience and is it difficult or do you just you find it easier the more you do absolutely I mean I've just um uh, I think it was posh asked a great question about the truth and and what have you yeah and I was saying that it may sound odd but to some extent as an investigator you're not concerned with the truth what you're concerned with is evidence the evaluation of that evidence, and then giving um, each piece of evidence appropriate weight. So it takes you to a place where you can say, it, it's heavier on that side, i.e. towards a finding of no case to answer, than it is to a finding of a case to answer. And whether or not it's the truth, is neither here nor there to that extent. It, it, it's about um, looking at all of the jigsaw pieces, picking out the most um, kind of essential pieces, the corner pieces or the middle pieces, um, it, um, depending on how you do jigsaws, and then seeing overall what the evidence does in terms of your belief, your understanding, based upon the material that you've gathered during the investigation that enabled you to come down on one side or the other. That's what the balance of probabilities is. It's this kind of, it's, it's, it's this kind of um, act of, you know, um, chucking the evidence up in the air and then seeing how it lands. Is there more of, you know, um, is there more evidence pointing to that than there is pointing to the other? Is the quality of the evidence, you know, something which can trump the quantity of evidence? These are all of the factors that you've got to weigh in mind. Whether somebody is telling the truth or not, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Only they know, quite frankly, sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, so doing an exercise like this that we've got on the screen helps you with that quality, quantity, and relevance um, kind of um, manipulation. That's what this is doing. So someone saying it absolutely happened yesterday and it was at four o'clock in the afternoon, you might give more weight to than someone who says, well, I think it was yesterday. And I can't remember whether it was the evening or the morning. So you've got two pieces of evidence, okay? In quantity, they're the same, but in quality, are they the same? Mm. Can you derive more confidence from one um, version than the other? It's that kind of nuanced, really subtle reading that matters. Can I absolutely say that deck is telling the truth? No, but what I can say is that he has a clear recollection and there was no doubt in and um, what he told me, whereas Jude, there was more doubt. So therefore, on that issue, on issue A, I prefer Jude's evidence. Uh, I prefer Dex's evidence. That that's how we 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 work in these cases, and that more importantly, you know, Stephen, that's what judges want to hear from investigators yeah. about yeah. 
you know, how they've weighed up the So why did you go in that direction rather than that direction, Mr. Alamo? Yeah. Yeah. I think, and just to add, add this, to turn this, take this back, I think you're right, is when you stand in front of the tribunal and that pulls it all together for you because it's exactly what the judge is home in on. But if we look at, just to support what you're saying there, Ab, if you look at row 17 where it says uh, what actually happened, you've got a very, uh, I'd gone to the dance floor versus um, uh, what uh, Judy's saying there. There will be differences of opinion. It would be extraordinary where you wouldn't have differences in recollection. Witnesses recall different things for different reasons um, and what's important to them. But when you go down to the next line, which is row 18, uh, Jude is very definite. Uh, and he's uh, sorry, Deck is very definite and says Jude was behind me. Whereas you use the language here of, of, of uh, Jude here and she says, I think, um, I think I would have. Not saying I did. It's not definite. It's I'm thinking this or I should have or I would have done this. It can come down to those nuances, which is exactly the point that Abby's saying, as to why did you prefer the evidence of one over the other? Okay, so that's how you deal with, not the truth, but the facts that you're faced with. Why do you prefer that evidence? What's the language? What's the recollection? You know, what's their state of mind? Has one been drinking, one has not been drinking? Um, and does that give uh, some sway to the weight of evidence you give to what they've said? Okay. So that deals with where you've got differences of opinion. When you've got, as we've got on this here, where we've gone off and interviewed another witness, you can see um, what Bill Al says is in this in row 17 again, I saw Jude uh, trying to steer um, deck towards the conga. You're getting a feel for it. And again, that evidence may tip you. It won't be exactly what you want to hear very often, but it may give you a deciding factor. Um, and then what we do, sorry. Uh, well, sorry, Steve, sorry for interrupting. You know, that kind of evidence is priceless when it might seem really innocuous because mm. we know our scope, we know what tests we're dealing with. We're dealing with unwanted conduct, which has a purpose or effect of creating da -de da -de da -de da So what Bilal's evidence goes to there is that key issue of whether or not the conduct was wanted or unwanted. Mm. Yeah, I saw you, you trying to steer deck towards the dance floor. It's almost as if it's talking about some reluctance on the part of deck with Jude having to, I don't know, steer it, kind of prompt it, force it, make it happen. Does that give you any hint in relation to uh, any steer as to whether or not conduct is wanted or unwanted? So those are the kind of nuances that we're dealing with. Very rarely in these um, cases do we have bombshell evidence you know, it, 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 it's subtle, it's, it's, it's reading it, it's um, interpreting it and having a reason for your interpretation. That's really important. And that's why in a lot of cases, particularly harassment discrimination cases, yeah, I'll say this bluntly, sometimes organizations just aren't sufficiently confident to make findings because they're, um, kind of need for certainty because of the nature of the case is what drives the outcome. But the test is always the same. The test doesn't change for a difficult case. It's the same. Is there evidence on the balance of probability to show something one way or the other? Mm. That's always the test. It never changes. Never, ever, ever changes. So apply that to what you've got and then you could make findings that you know are more confident and perhaps a bit more robust and um, a bit more um, kind of um, yeah focused and, and 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 certain. It goes back to what you said about tribunals. They're not going to determine whether you were absolutely right or wrong in your decision. That's what they that. determine is. Was it reasonable to get to the conclusion you did? Would another employer have reasonably got to a similar point based on what your facts you had in front of you? Um, so that's that's what you've got to remember. You're not the police. You're not having to prove beyond all reasonable doubt. It's how did you get there? And was that something somebody reasonably would have or could have done? Um, but as I've said here, we if you go to the line 16 above, the priceless evidence here is this is all about perceptions. This was a statement that had been used thousands or many, many times um and 
there was a perception that there was a sexual connotation to it in the Conga. When you read the evidence of Balao on the next uh, on the next box across, that's somebody else's perception. Now they could be equally wrong, but it wouldn't be unreasonable to say, look, I have some independent evidence here, subject to the relationships questions that would come out and friendships questions. There is potentially something to support the perception on that particular night, which was different from the um, the statements which have been made many, many times before. So again, you show your workings. And if there wasn't a Bilal, let's say that statement hadn't come up, there would be nothing wrong sometimes just to take a couple of names out of the hat at the Christmas party or who else was in the conga or around at that time to get that perception if you can't make it your mind up one way or the other. What you don't do is go and interview everybody that's at the Christmas party. So there's nothing to stop you expanding your investigation. And if there is some evidence, fine. If there's not, you've made a reasonable inquiry to, to, to come down maybe the other way. Um, but I think that uh, it's important not to, to, to expand your remit too much, but make a reasonable inquiry. Okay, good. Um, I think we've addressed most of the questions. Have, did you see any other questions around this topic uh, come up in, as, we, as we were uh, watching that video? No, no, I, de I dealt with those that were in the chat from um, the likes of um, Rebecca and, 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 and Jeanette. So um, yeah, I think we captured them all. Great. So if we, I think if we go to the next tab, I think we'll have in there the definition of harassment um, from memory. So if we go across, is it slightly lower down, Jenna, and across a bit? I might be wrong. There we go. So we can see now exactly what Abba said is it's not what we think it's not who we like we might like Jude we might just think this was just a Christmas party we're looking at the facts and what we've been told and now we measure that against that definition so was there unwanted conduct if you take the evidence of um, Deck and then you look at the evidence of Balau it seems that there was some unwanted conduct going on their perception was very similar it wasn't something that was being encouraged it appears to be unwanted. Was it of a sexual nature, et cetera, et cetera? And was it connected to protected characteristic? Well, the gender is clear there. So here is, it goes to Ab's point, sometimes there's a reluctance to uphold grievances, but you can actually undermine yourself as an employer and find yourself in much more difficult um, circumstances if these cases come to tribunal, if you're not reasonable in your conclusions. Uh, there's a great um, desire sometimes not to uphold a grievance, but actually that can do you more damage um, and it goes against natural instinct there. But Ab, that's something I think you mentioned to me. You know, go to the definition. If the definition is satisfied, um, you know, you need to be brave and to, to address it that way. Well, this is your scope and your fundamentals. So what is it that the commissioning manager is asking me to do in relation to Deck's complaint that Jude... Um, touched him and spoke to him in a way which was, which had sexual overtones. What I'm being asked to do effectively is determine whether there's evidence that that took place and whether it amounts to sexual harassment. So I need the definition of sexual harassment to inform me as to what questions I should ask. The wanted or unwanted nature of the conduct is important. So We've asked questions about that. We've gathered evidence about that. What does that evidence tell us? Is there anything that points to the conduct being unwanted? Deck trying to leave. Bilal saying that um, Deck um, kind of had to be almost pulled into the conga. All of that shows an element of reluctance. So on that basis, I'm thinking I'm leaning towards on the balance of probability saying that there seem to be unwanted conduct. Then is it of a sexual nature? Have I got anything to assist on that? Well, obviously I've got Dex impression, um, but also I've got Bilal saying that um, um, uh, uh, Jude seemed to be focused on Dex during the evening. So, you know, obviously we need to kind of make this um, session proportionate, but I would have been asking um, Jude questions about the extent to which she was following um, um, Jude, um, Jude questions about whether she was following Deck around all night. And, you know, can you give me some indication of why that was? Is there anything, you know, between you and Deck that, you know, could make him 
think or somebody else think that there was an interest which went beyond just professional um, colleagues. Would you say if you know someone was seeing it that you know you follow Decker around that way that it could reasonably be regarded as there might you know be something else to it? I'd be asking those kind of questions and and getting her impression on those kind of questions. All of that would then feed into a finding as to whether or not there was some kind of sexual interest or an interest which was more than just professional and you know a bit more romantic so to speak it, in, it often in these cases it's all you've got and i'm going to keep saying judges understand that and that's why you know the law the case law the approach enables you to draw conclusions from kind of circumstantial evidence and non-direct evidence we call it drawing inferences i think stephen don't we technically yes can yes. we draw inferences from any material that we've got those are the skills we need as investigators we can't just hold our hands up in the air throw our hands up in the air and say well we're not really good at this we've got to be good at it yeah. we've got to be good at it whether it's me doing it or or you know a manager from the factory doing it that 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 that's that's the job so yeah great um what i think is important here and i know we've we've given us a, a a reasonably um i wouldn't even call it straightforward i don't think any harassment case is straightforward but what this planning does is you can see now by planning at the beginning giving structure to how we approach this and who we need to speak to and just summarizing some of the key points as we take that evidence naturally clarifies in your own mind how you're going to structure your report so you've got each issue, you've dealt with it in sequence, you've got the balance of evidence, and that will naturally or should naturally lead you to a conclusion or a ability to support your conclusion. It makes the investigation report 10 times easier to write rather than having all these facts in your mind and still thinking, well, I prefer the evidence of Deck um, or I feel for Jude, she's been caught out here, et cetera, et cetera. She seems to be one that's taking the, the front for these comments. None of that's relevant. None of that's relevant. It's clearly statement evidence supporting evidence what's the rule that's got to be my conclusion because and it's the because bit that's important so hopefully the three-part technique is uh, it, it will be as useful to you um when you come to your report remember what i said there is it's very um tempting to say when you've come to this point on the evidence you see there is i conclude that this event occurred once you do that you're going into the territory of prejudging things what you can say is that I believe on the information that this needs to be considered further. There seems to be some supporting evidence that needs to be considered further, something along those lines, so that further consideration is being given by somebody independent, the disciplining manager. And that's the important there. Now you can put recommendations in. Um, the, the most important thing here is the surrounding circumstances. Was there any, any mitigating factors here or aggravating factors here? Um, I would say that the feelings that Deck has explained to us is that I think those are background factors that a, a disciplining manager would need to be aware of. You know, he doesn't want to stop coming into work, but that's the point it's got to. The mitigating factors may be, look, there has been some banter going on before and nobody has managed that banter. Maybe we need to readdress and put some training in place with regard to banter. Another document we might have need to check on before it goes to disciplinary is whether there was any notice or um, you know, the usual message that goes out, enjoy the Christmas party, but remember, you know, behave yourselves effectively. You see so many messages along those lines, um, but those are all relevant documents and relevant information where people are aware that, you know, you don't take things too far. There is a limit to what you can do. This is still a work do. So having made those recommendations, remember, if you weren't satisfied by the evidence, you're always free to come to the conclusion that there is no case to answer. But you can still put recommendations in place, even if you don't think so. Recommendation may be that we we have a round the table discussion. We rebuild that relationship. What often is missed on a grievance, and we deal with this in our grievance and investigations training, is the follow up with those. The allegations that have been made against someone will affect the relationship as well as the person that feels like they've not actually had their case upheld. So it's the important follow up as well that we, we also deliver some training on. Now, there's been a lot there today. We have deliberately left some time for further questions. We've addressed many of those as we go along, but we've got some time now uh, for any further questions and to go into a bit more detail. 
um, as I said before, we will be sending out um, an investigations workbook. A lot of what we've done today will be there. Um, Abs mentioned tribunals a couple of times because that's ultimately the measure that we will be out and there. Uh, Joe's kindly arranged with ourselves a mock investigation, which I think is in January. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, the 11th of January. I will be sending a link out to everybody that signed up later this afternoon. Yeah, if I remember right, it's an Tribunal afternoon. Tribunal, Stephen. Sorry? It's Mock Tribunal in January. Mock Tribunal, yeah. yeah, Mock Tribunal. So now you've seen the investigation, it would be useful now to see where these things can end up and then what you can see is the importance and how this all links together. I think you can't get anything better than that, a tribunal experience, but possibly one thing better is a mock tribunal rather than the real thing in that you've got a, a much nicer learning atmosphere. Um, so feel free to, to uh, when Joe sends that out, feel free to now link the two. But I'd invite my Vista colleagues and Joe, is there, a, um, if I go to you, Ab, is there anything that you feel that maybe it was worth just emphasizing or clarifying? You know, um, the, 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 my, um, observation on in investigations and, and, and investigators is it, it, it becomes really difficult to sort it all out in the head in, at the end and then to um, translate it onto paper um, into um, a report or an outcome letter or whatever it may be because the, there's so much evidence whirring around your head and um, what I always say is when you're trying to write a report, don't think that you have to get it right first time for you. Okay, when you're when you're writing it, I always say don't write it as if it's the final version. Just spew out what you've got in your head and your um, kind of findings and conclusions con conclusions on each subject, even if they conflict with each other so you know you might on a first writing you know find in favor of um, someone and against someone almost in, in in the same sentence there's nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with it at all because when you go back through it what you'll be doing is refining it and saying well hold on a second that finding can't make sense because of that piece of evidence over there so even though it did seem at first blush as if it was unwanted. Now that I've kind of uh, understood the prominence of Bill Owl's evidence, I'm gonna um, kind of take out that bit where I had any doubt as to whether it was wanted or unwanted. And I'm gonna go in that direction because of that piece of evidence. So you get this thing as you kind of, you know, just throw everything into the document of being able to rule stuff out and then have a direct line between a finding and a piece of evidence. God, how unique is that? Mm. You've got a finding, a conclusion, and then you've got some evidence to back it up. So going through it in that way, I, I, I use this, you know, my boring plastering analogy. You know, you, 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 you see a smooth wall on, in a house and, you know, you say, oh, well, you know, that's great. That must be a great plasterer. But that started as a swirling mess. It started as a plasterer just throwing plaster onto a wall. And then it's being refined all of the time and being smoothed out. It's having bits taken out of it. That's what an investigation report is. That, that really is how, the best way to do it. Don't worry about getting it right first time just smash the plaster onto the wall and then start refining it down when you keep looking back to the imperfections, okay? And that um, spreadsheet that you've got there really helps you to do that, okay? It really, really helps you to do that because you've got all of the competing and contrasting evidence. Get it down into some kind of document and then start your smoothing process until you've got a finely plastered wall and you can you know, walk away from it and say, job done if anyone asks me about that i can tell them exactly how i got there and then wait for another that. Yeah. yeah your tribunal ready then yeah, yeah. If, if if needs be your tribunal yeah. ready <laughs> there's a good question here is that there's um there's talking about the informal approach um and what do you do if then you find there is a breach of rules i would i'm slightly more cautious as uh, not cautious but more pragmatic as a lawyer 
I think there's certain allegations that I, I am more reluctant to treat on an informal basis. Um, and those would be anything to do with discrimination, harassment, victimization, and whistleblowing. Generally, those allegations are not only serious for the individual that's raised them, they are serious allegations. If, if I was subject to those allegations, I'd be distraught. So actually, it's important for me to have the opportunity to clear my name and have that matter investigated properly, uh, rather than for people to think, oh, it's dealt with, brushed under the carpet, he may, he may well have been discriminatory. I think those sort of areas, I am reluctant to go informal, um, particularly in this case where DEC has gone to the point of actually putting it in writing and has expressed the impact that it's having on that individual. I think you've always got the opportunity in most issues to say to somebody, look, I've got your letter, or I've heard what you've said, um, we've got a couple of options here. We have got the informal approach and the advantage of that is naturally that it maintains relationships. But on this particular issue, because of the implications and the allegations, I would be reluctant to have gone back to the informal stage. Um, I think it's gone beyond that um, uh, on those. But those are sort of there's some red flag topics that I am more. It's always a question worth asking, but generally I. I I wouldn't in this particular case because of the level it's reached and because of the, the, the nature of the allegations. It's, it's fair on the individual. It's also fair on the, the person that's facing those allegations. So hopefully that addresses that. Ab, you, do you have a different view in, in terms of that? Are you more relaxed than I am? Judgment calls. All of these things are what I call judgment calls because ultimately as an organisation, you have the absolute right to determine whether you go formal or informal on any issue. So it's about looking at what are the factors which drive you one way or the other. So, you know, does the complainant want it formal? Is it the kind of thing that would normally, um, in, you know, the experience of the organization result in a formal um, process? Um, to what extent, um, you know, does it um, kind of um, set any precedent? All of those kind of things. If you take those factors into account, you know, um, tick them or cross them on a checklist, and then you can come up with your own answer and have the confidence um, that, you know, should anyone challenge it, you can explain it and uh, justify it. That's the job. Yeah. For me. If, yeah. If, if Deck had come forward on this case and said, look, it's just gone a bit further. I've been able to deal with it up to date and it's just gone a bit further on this Christmas party. And I said to him, well, how, you know, we've got a couple of options here. We've got the formal, we've got the informal. Have you thought about that? Have you got a preference? If they came back and said, look, I just want that not to be repeated. Uh, then we'll check to see whether whether that individual would then want me to deal with it informally. That's a possibility. So it is a judgment call. But on this particular case, I I wouldn't have taken the I wouldn't be tempted to go down the informal route. So hopefully that that's answered the question there. Um, I, agree with, I agree with Nicole. I agree with Nicole. Uh, ultimately, sexual harassment is you know serious misconduct. So yeah. you don't yeah. go informal for yeah. an allegation of sexual harassment. Yeah, I think any harassment, discrimination or victimisation and whistleblowing, those are the areas where I, I it's serious, it's serious for the, 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 um, the person who's aggrieved and it's serious for the, for the accused. So I, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Has anybody else got some questions that we may have missed to go along? Joe, I know you were kindly keeping an eye on things. Is there anything that popped up that we uh, that we didn't have the opportunity to address? I think, um, I think Ab's mentioned, um, answered quite a lot of them, to be perfectly honest. Great. Good. Great. Um, right, well, we'll hang on for one minute more just to see if anything poor, um, picks up. And other than that, I think a few people have had to leave at 12 o'clock. But yeah. what I would say is that if you want to stay on, if there's any specific cases that you want to pick up, um, but it's not appropriate for a group chat, just stay on at the end. Uh, Ab, myself and the team will remain just uh, for a five, 10 minutes and we're happy to just pick those up. Um, we have flown through things. We do provide more detailed training for investigations and we've got a couple more sessions coming up. Uh, I think is it the 30th of November and 6th of December. So if you think this would be useful for your colleagues, some managers, etc., feel free to join those sessions and contact either Joe or ourselves for further details if you want. Um, but other than that, we would just say thank you very much. Uh, some great questions there. Obviously, some experience in the group. It's not easy. It's not easy, the investigation. But remember that three part technique. Um, and uh, you won't go far wrong. Joe, thank you very much for arranging things. Jen, I know you were running around as I was talking. You were keeping up with me rem remarkably well. So thanks to both of you um, and Yvonne. Yvonne, is there anything from a HR perspective or Joe that you both wanted to add? The point I made about the investigation report is one that 
I've certainly come across and, and many other people that I know where they're so worried about trying to get this report right first time. And the point that I've made about the plastering and the chucking it all on the wall and then smoothing it all out afterwards, I think is a really, really good one to, to remember. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, just from our perspective, Joe uh, jo and Jen, there's just one there from, I think, Ella that's just said if she could have further information that's just gone through the screen. So that's no problem at all. But um, to everybody who's kindly helped prepare this, which is the hard work, uh, and Ab for jumping on and sharing his experience. Thank you all. Um, and we'll conclude everything from there, but thank you. Yeah. Excellent. All right. We'll, we'll, I'll send out an email to everybody that's registered um, and they will have details on about signing up for future events. And also there's the information about how to access a copy of the recording and also the investigations um, leaflet that uh, we've talked about earlier. So I'd just like to say thanks very much to you all at Vista for your time and effort into putting the investigation together. And also thanks very much to the listeners for tuning in. Really appreciate Excellent. it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well said. Okay. Goodbye, Cheerio. everybody. Have bye. a great day. And you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.